The exam consists of uh, a mixture of questions. Those questions include very short answer questions, such as uh, true-false, uh, fill-in-the-blank, that sort of thing. It includes a number of questions that are, I would call, sort of mid-range in size, where you'll be asked to provide sentences or, or uh, you know, bullet points on particular items, similar to the pop quizzes. And it will involve some questions that are longer in their formulation, and that will require not essays, but, um, but uh, material that's, um, that requires longer, longer responses. Okay? Um, it can include paragraphs. Um, it's more likely to include enumerations uh, that are longer than just the types of, of material we cover within the, uh, the pop quizzes. Because this quiz will be delivered on the computers, um, the format is somewhat different than what you're used to, but uh, it should be familiar at some level. You'll be um, able to go forward and backward, sort of random access, as it were, to any, to any question. But by default, you can, you can go forward. You can always go back and review. You can mark questions as worthy of later you know, reflection. So if you're not sure about something, you can easily come back to it by showing uh, a marker there. Um, you can emphasize things, uh, you know, bold, all that sort of stuff, uh, italics. Um, you will be able to, um, uh, to, to see the marks for any one question, but only one question will be shown at a time, okay? So you won't be, you won't be presented with this very long list um, of, of questions at once. It'll be, it'll be one at a time. Um, the exam, beyond, beyond the questions that are sort of seeking to elicit your expert, expertise in answering particular uh, queries, there's going to be a set of questions on the exam that are of great significance for, um, for parceling out uh, credit in this course for the work that's been done, and uh, I'll be with you in a minute. Um, oh, no. oh, okay. Uh, and and for the marking, these include questions related to your contributions from your own perspective, and as gathered from others' perspectives to that to that term project. Okay. Those should be interpreted in a broad way. By contributions, I'm not asking, you know, I'm not, I'm not asking specifically who wrote the most code. I'm not asking who did the most tests. I'm talking contributions in the sense if we didn't have this person, how much would the project have have lost ground, or or how much how grievously would it have suffered? Um, uh, and. Uh, these these uh, types of questions have more open-ended answers. I will be asking you what were your primary contributions as you see them. So if you were responsible for, you know, maintaining the, the smoke test over the course of the semester and um, high-level system testing, for example, to use a jumble of things, um, you should be able to spell that out. Um, you will be asked, what did others contribute? And I'll be sort of looking for some measure of corroboration. That component will include some quantitative questions as well as uh, qualitative questions, which will help give me a, a sense of people's uh, contributions. There are four, I think, four or five such questions. Um, I. Uh, sought to place these all at the end of the questions. The tech staff has been working with me with, uh, with the delivery mechanisms for this exam. I believe they're gonna be at the end of the exam, but if they pop up in the middle of the exam, just be aware that um, you will wanna answer them even though 
you won't be receiving credit for them. It's not, it's not like you'll be marked you know, larger amounts with one exception from those polar. That one exception is you have the option as part of the exam of writing, of contributing, as part of the exam writing, the um, uh, individual postmortem. Or supplementing your individual postmortem if you see fit. If you're providing a separate one, conceivably you could, you know, you could say more um, in the, the exam. Um, that will contribute towards your mark uh, directly in the sense that it's, it's one of the things I, I use to judge um, the performance of an individual is the thoughtfulness and, and substantive character of uh, postmortem documents. That includes group, but it also includes individual. Um, I have built up, you're, you're not obligated to fill out that one if you have a separate individual postmortem that you are planning to submit separately. As we speak upon the Moodle site, you will find uh, hand ins available for the postmortems for both the group, one for group, and for your individual uh, contributions. And you're welcome to submit any time between now and exam time tomorrow for those. Just be aware of that individual one you can also do as part of the exam. Um, the exam, um, I would characterize as, and, and this is based on a lot of experience with past exams, I would characterize myself as having scaled back somewhat the number of questions. Um, in part that's because we didn't get to certain material that I was hoping to, for example, on software entrepreneurship. Um, and uh, we went a bit lighter on some material uh, involving testing for object-oriented systems with the Liskov substitution principle, um, which and those sort of circumscribe the set of questions I can ask. Um, I'd be surprised if there's too many people here at the end of the exam um, period, um, but uh, you know I'd be surprised also if every single person is left by then, except of course myself. Um, so. Um, uh, so I, I think it's, some people take longer to write it. We used to do it all by hand and students would be shaking their hands um, at the end. With writing it on the computer, hopefully it'll be both easier on your hands and more pleasant and quicker. Um, let's see, um, other things about format. Um, there is a pronounced difference in the number of marks associated with different questions. The marks generally vary between questions that have a single mark uh, associated with them and those that have 10 or so marks. So just be aware there's an order of magnitude difference. Check out the marks. Right? Um, I will be here, uh, I anticipate, for essentially the entire time of the exam, uh, barring some unforeseen catastrophe. Um, and um, I'd be able to answer questions. There are a couple students writing separately, and I want to just make students avail, uh, aware um, that uh, the rooms for, for students writing separately will be the breakout rooms over in the, uh, the area, um, in I guess what's technically called S360, just off of S360, the breakout rooms on either side, 341 or two, or 371. I'll have to check which one it is. Um, I will be circulating to those rooms a bit so that I can answer questions there, and they'll be individuated there as, as well as myself uh, based here. Um, what other things? Oh, yeah. Um, it's imperative that when you finish writing your exam, be sure to then, and only then, press the formal submission button. Otherwise, you may be logged out of these computers um, in a most unseemly fashion. You are not, during the exam, allowed to use um, uh, devices, books, references. The computers will be disabled from uh, internet access. Okay? So you're not going to be able to browse and 
look up my videos <laughs> or what, but whatever. Um, uh, so, so those computers are in a lockdown state that's unique to their configuration. Um, let's see, other, other points. Um, yeah, um, it's in your interest to give more complete answers, reasoning. Um, I tend not to take off for reasoning. Like if you do a true false and you got the right answer, but it's for the wrong reason, I still tend to give credit for that. Uh, by contrast, if you give the wrong answer, but for a good reason, I tend to give a lot of credit for that. So giving some motivation for your answer, some thinking behind it, uh, generally is, you know, is, is advisable. Um, those are, um, those are most of the comments on the, uh, the exam itself. I, I will tell you the total number of marks so you can kind of pace yourself uh, as you go through the marks. Um, and as I said, you can come back and revisit uh, earlier filled out uh, ones. Okay, so those are some prepared remarks on the format of the exam. What questions could I answer related to the format of the exam before getting into the content of the exam? I'm, and by content, I'm talking you know, specific subjects covered, which would be the bulk of this session. What, yeah? yeah. You don't have to fill it out. Yeah. So I will be paying attention. And there's actually a fair bit of bookkeeping because I actually do check if, if there's one of both, then I end up you know, sort of synthesizing from both and so on. But yes, um, you're welcome to hand in on time, in which case you don't have to answer that question that's the individual postmortem on the exam. Okay. And uh, that's a, a welcome. Uh, a welcome strategy to use that will offload some time from the exam. If other things strike you during the exam um, that you want to add, you, you can't do that. And by the same token, if you choose to do the individual plus more on the exam, you don't have to turn in one uh, online. Okay. Other questions on, on exams sort of administer the uh, format and uh, you know, delivery vehicle, the computers, that sort of stuff. Other thing? Yeah. Do you have a ring metal keyboard? Um, <laughs> I am writing a lot. Dvorak or something? No, no, just uh, mechanical, nicer to type on. Say, um, it's, it's an unusual request. Uh, I, I, th I think that that would count as um, a step too far because we would have to somehow disconnect the existing keyboard and connect that up. And I can't promise that it will be compatible with the requisite drivers. I, I don't want to get into to issues like that. These keyboards are not encumbered by, you know, undue amounts of gum <laughs> or, or, or stickiness to the best of my knowledge. So, um, you know, it, Let's not bring extra keyboards or, for that matter, extra monitors. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you want a you know, 50, 50 inch display. Um, no, no, we, we won't do that. Um, speakers. Uh, it surrounds out. <laughs> Sounds ominous. Uh, okay, other, other questions? So that's the minister of the, uh, with the exam. Um, I think you'll find it a better, better experience. Okay. Um, it does record where people sit, and, and um, it, it, it's possible we'll, at the, we'll enable some randomization of questions. So if you speak to the person next to you, be aware that your question one is probably different from that question one. Um, I do not speak with the person I speak. Okay, um, so with those comments on general features of the exam, um, uh, sort of format and, and infrastructure and so on, 
Let's go on to talk about um, the main sort of subject of our gathering today. Um, this has to do with uh, the, uh, the content for the course. And um, I have a articulated set of slides that pretty much cover some degree every topic we talk about. And my default plan is to go through them in step by step slide. And to uh, articulate for each of those topics major points. And uh, those major points of emphasis have a uncanny likelihood of appearing at some form on the exam. So it tends to be a very uh, fruitful exercise um, uh, from the standpoint of studying for the exam. It also gets you to understand what, what I think some of the major points are. Uh, however, it's a lot of material. And uh, there may be very specific questions you folks have about certain material that you'd like answered before I begin. So if there are certain items that you would like me to pronounce on, um, I'd be happy to, to do that up front here. Um, so if you want uh, you know, my sense of what some of the major points are for estimation, or you want me to, to comment on the Liskov substitution principle and what you folks are responsible for, if you want me to to say something about the prime path algorithm and, and you know, to what degree you need to memorize each piece of it or, or whatever, um, let me know. And I can, I can comment on what you're responsible for in any one of those things or, or opine on what I see as some of the major points in each of those areas before diving in to this more comprehensive coverage as it were. Um, so let me start by asking. Does anyone want me to address, in that way, particular topics that, that you're wondering about? You perhaps can tell my English lapses in the evening. Is there, are there any, of, any specific topics you're feeling confused about, where you are, um, where you'd like uh, clarifications up front? Um, or you want to know for what uh, subset of the material covered in class you're responsible? Okay, uh, uh, so I'll take that as a no. Um, and uh, I'll dive in and, and please volunteer that information later. So if something I say strikes you you know, fires, leads to certain neurons being fired that remind you, oh yeah, I, I want to know, are we really responsible for that ask, okay? Okay, so let's, let's, let's talk about a few sort of major, uh, major areas. Um, well, okay, this, somehow there's a reordering here. Um, notable topics covered within the course of the semester, these are, a set of topics which I think, um, you know, every one of them you um, have some requirements to, to, to know, uh, no information. A lot of this course was at some level on risk management more generally um, and quality assurance more particularly um, within sort of risk management, you could, you could argue. Um, so uh, inspections and peer review, continuous integration, code contracts, defect estimation, um, specifications, or, or uh, really that should be together with code contracts. Uh, testing, um, I would expect a major emphasis on testing. I smile because I finished up my testing of the applications last night, and those investigations lent not only marks to the projects, um, but 
lengthy a conviction that um, emphasizing testing further would not hurt. Um, so, uh, you know, general principle, path-based testing, we talked about different levels of path-based testing, subsumption hierarchies, um, uh, ways in which we, we can, uh, at a concrete level, identify um, and cover certain types of uh, constructs, nodes, transitions, prime paths. Um, we talked about testability and, and achieving testability through a variety of mechanisms. We did talk about a little bit of testing for object-oriented systems. And like so many of these things, like the real question here is what are the 90% I don't cover? But I talked about the Liskov substitution principle in, 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 in particular. I talked, ladies and gentlemen, about um, what it means for, to, for one type to be a behavioral subtype of another. Um, a sort of true subtype, uh, a genuine subtype, not a fraudulent one. We talked about test case design and some principles for identifying um, good test cases, whether it's orthogonal arrays. I, I made reference, I think, a little bit to Latin hypercubes or Latin squares, but, uh, but, uh, but uh, this whole idea of equivalence classes and boundary value, uh, boundary cases. And we talked, um, we talked about how we could use certain constructs like trees and so on to identify uh, test cases. Um, I talked about, I uh, gave some tips and, and some testing uh, procedures and different levels of testing. Give me some different levels of testing. Let's make this interactive. This level of interactivity has been limited thus far. Um, yeah, unit testing is, is one level of testing. Good. Yeah, Matt. Sorry? Uh, system and integration. Yeah, system and integration testing. That's exactly right. Um, uh, so, and, and generally, unit testing tests you know, functions, methods, um, classes, and isolation. Uh, integration testing tests do things play together nicely. System tests test, you know, uh, particularly the system operation for cross cutting use cases that may involve. Um, several features successively, right? Um, uh, these are different levels of testing. Often there's acceptance testing at any higher, higher level, sort of uh, criteria for the system to be viewed as complete. Um, scheduling. Um, we, we didn't hit on this too much, but um, we, we certainly talked about it in the context of estimation some, which is, um, uh, it has to do with sort of uh, identifying the sub pieces of a given type of work um, and estimating each in order to estimate how long it takes to, to estimate the whole. Sometimes in this class, very often we go into formal CPM scheduling where we have dependencies between tasks. And uh, from the front of 124, one, one uh, day, I, I did speak about the fact that um, beyond estimation, there's also a need, often at a practical level, to reason about when one task depends on another. Um, like you can't start testing until the, the code is submitted, right, Emily? Um, and uh, and you know this this lends dependencies between tasks, and it's not merely a matter of necessarily just adding up the time always because you have dependencies which can lead to one thing being, uh, in one case, not being able to be started until the first one finishes, or in some cases there's no dependency and they can run concurrently. They can run together. They can run at the same time. Um, uh, quality coding. Um, I did uh, share with you some perspectives on code quality and code smells. Um, and we went through some code together, and that's fair game. I could, I could ask you to sort of look at a piece of code and, and critique it from the standpoint of um, smells to be improved um, or to be reduced. Um, uh, requirement solicitation, we talked about some principles there. What are some ways that we can um, 
help lessen the chance that things will fall through the cracks, that there'll be misunderstanding and requirements um, uh, between the stakeholder and uh, the technical team or between members on the technical team. Um, uh, we talked about sort of best practices and requirement solicitation um, uh, as well. Uh, continuous integration, um, this is a point of, of some discussion, it's kind of over there in QA, but, but I, I put it here as well. Um, the whole principle that, look, breaking up our tasks into smaller chunks and committing them and, and issuing pull requests that are, that are smaller in character, and so we're on an ongoing basis contributing code uh, in smaller chunks has a number of benefits. And amongst other things, it avoids the big bang syndrome where, you know, towards the end of a project, lots of things are checked in together and all hell breaks loose because things don't work um, uh, together. Maybe things contributed by multiple parties don't play together nicely. Um, and continuous integration can help uh, lower that chance. It can allow for testing to go on on an ongoing basis, continuous integration can give a sense of, uh, of progress that can help uh, head off stylistic issues and concerns about uh, code quality earlier. It can allow tests to be written um, as well as run um, all uh, along the way, et cetera. Um, and it can allow different parties to do different work checking in and getting each other's updates on an ongoing basis. We talk quite a bit about risk management in this class. To a degree, a lot of elements of the class can be thought of as kind of risk management writ large, like um, balancing the risks associated with the project um, uh, throughout, throughout its, um, its phases. And we talked about several different types of things there, um, contingency planning versus uh, mitigation, for example. We talked about the role of risk scanning, looking for new risks and identifying when previously identified risks are materializing, or, or have, have a strong chance of materializing. Um, and we talked about sort of elements associated with project phases. And in one diagram I, uh, I drew up, um, you know, project, successive project phases as you find a defect um, successively later in the project. Maybe there's a, you know, unidentified issue in requirements that you don't find, maybe you find it, uh, for example, in requirements phase, you find it in design phase, you find it in code implementation phase, or you find it more in testing, or you find it post deployment. And the amount of work that has to be done to completely resolve this defect and make the system newly consistent. Does it rise or go down as we find a defect later? Depends. Evidence suggests it actually rises, and it rises exponentially. Why is that? Why, why would the amount of work required to fix a defect go up as, as time, uh, time goes on? Yeah, that's true, Matt. That's, that's actually a good insight. That's right. Sometimes bugs breed bugs, right? Because people try to put in workarounds. They don't quite work. Sometimes defects also block the discovery of other defects. Do they not? Speak on. No longer callow youths. Um, so, uh, so uh, yeah, so bugs tend to breed bugs. Um, and... Uh, that can be a cause for this. But also, as you find a defect later and later, there's another feature, too. What, what is it? The system's more complex. Yeah, the system's, system's more complex. And you end up having to throw away more stuff. I mean, if you have a misunderstood defect of, up here and you find it up here, maybe you have to change the requirements document. If you find it late in the design phase, maybe you have to redo some elements of the design because the design has to be updated to reflect the fact that, oh, this isn't as simple as we thought. Maybe if you find an implementation phase, you're going to have to 
throw away some code or, or redo some code. But in the testing phase, there's a heck of a lot of test cases that might have to be redone and manual testing that has to be redone. You find it post-deployment, and guess what? The user, the end user, might have to redo some of their work. Um, and, and that's no fun for anyone. Um, so, you know, when, we are, when we're dealing with agile development, these phases um, uh, are still there. They're just uh, at a smaller level. Um, and in some unfortunate cases, they're compressed. Um, uh, and uh, and uh, yeah, this, this same phenomenon tends to go on. Sometimes you even find one sprint leaving defects to be discovered uh, in another. So some art overarching themes from the class. Um, you know, proactive thinking, um, taking action ahead of time to, to lower vulnerabilities, to, to head off problems. So, you know, sometimes said in the world, it's a sad truth, I tell you. Take it from an old man. It's hard to get credit in this world for preventing fires that never happened. Let me unpack that for you. Um, it's very, this is so, uh, a deep truth uh, that applies to information technologists. Um, prevention is rarely recognized with all the value that it offers because you don't see the counterfactual, you don't see what it's preventing. If it's successful, you've Avoid it. Maybe it's big security, you know, a big security disaster that could have happened. But because you've avoided it, you don't get credit for it because people don't see it happen, right? Um, they don't say, "Oh, he prevented this big disaster from from happening because the disaster never did end up materializing." And you don't know what you avoided. Um, uh, just like fire prevention, I mean, you don't know what fires you prevented by having. Um, by having good mechanisms in place to, you know, to avoid flammables being around or what have you. Um, people get credit for the heroics sometimes for fighting fires. They get credited for the heroics associated with being a hero on a project, but they often don't get credit for, um, for heading off big problems. Um, and yet, it can cause great increases in our quality of life as information technologists to head issues off. Um, and although we don't see what we have avoided in its full detail, it's close enough sometimes we can smell the coffee. Okay, um, risk management um, sort of uh, was, a, was a related theme, um, you know, that extended throughout the course. Uh, Uncertainty and dealing with uncertainty, uh, risk and achieving flexibility through good design, through, um, through appropriate architecture, um, through good, where else do we achieve flexibility besides the technical underpinnings, the nuts and bolts, so to speak, in software? Where else do we achieve flexibility? Mm. Um, Amazing. Uh, by, uh, Good. Yeah. Figuring out which ones rely on others and making sure that you can cut things out if Good. they're not going to work. Yeah, that's right. So, so rolling things out in an appropriate order, um, in an order that allows, perhaps lays the, the technical framework for, for uh, going in different directions subsequently. So that's an important insight. Um, flexibility is also achieved, ladies and gentlemen, through processes. Okay. Um, uh, Having people shadow each other so that one can take up the position of the other um, in the event of sickness. Um, flexibility in terms of who does the work by spreading knowledge around the team, spreading knowledge and the technologies involved. So multiple people can can work on a given task. Um, knowledge about how the uh, uh, the build system or the continuous integration setup, uh, the smoke test works so that multiple people can work on it. Um, flexibility has value. There's a whole field called real options focused on the value of flexibility. And it has real, real value um, in the end. We try, to, we try to raise our bus number. What is our bus number? 
yeah, how many people need to be hit by a bus such that if that happens, the project's like, it's game over. Might as well pack up and go home. Um, it, this, is, this is now almost hopeless. Um, and you wanna raise your bus number. You wanna, you, you want it to be more robust so if one person isn't lost, it's, it's uh, in real trouble. Um, problems come up at interfaces. Um, interfaces between people, uh, things fall through the cracks, um, misunderstandings arise, promises are made that people count on that are not delivered on, there's differences in knowledge across between people, but it's through at a technical level too. Um, you know, you, you divide and conquer with software, right? Um, and sometimes there's overlap where there shouldn't be, there needn't be, and sometimes things don't get handled on either side, or sometimes the, the two sides interpret a given code, two, or return value of one, or zero, as differently than the other one meant it to me. Um, and often it's at these junctures, these kind of interfaces, um, uh, that, that things fall through the cracks. Um, opportunity cost. What's an opportunity cost? The cost of uh, giving up or taking an opportunity. Yeah, yeah. So in Latin, the term decide means actually to cut off. Um, uh, so, so choosing A means foregoing B. And, and uh, choosing A may have value, but foregoing B eliminates an option for you. And generally you need to, you want to consider that. It's, it's not so much A, you get this value um, in and of itself, you've foregone this other value. Things have opportunity costs. Choosing one, making one choice will often end up uh, costing you in terms of the uh, the implication. Sometimes the opportunity costs outweigh the benefit. So you, you've chosen one thing, it offers some benefits, but by foregoing something else that could be of even greater value in certain circumstances, you've actually lost ground. It may not be obvious, but it may be that the other opportunity would offer even greater value under certain circumstances, and you, you've cut that off. Um, where does this come up in software? Well, lots of places. Look, it comes up all the time when you have limited resources. Um, and for example, testing. You test some one thing, often because you have limited time, you can't test another thing because of it. You, uh, you put your effort in one feature and it may rule out other features. Um, it means basically you gotta be judicious in your, in your consideration. You've got to be prioritized what we're gonna roll out what tests we're going to undertake um, in an intelligent uh, fashion or else you'll be potentially shortchanging yourself. Um, you'll be adding benefit, but foregoing such things that you've actually lost ground. Um, advantages of doing things early. Um, getting things in place early. Doing code freezes early good thing with a capital G and I would add a capital T. Uh, getting in place certain risky decisions to evaluate them with a spike prototype. What's a spike prototype? Throwaway prototype? Yeah, it's a throwaway prototype. That in a spike, so a prototype in general, the word is used to denote throwaway uh, system, but Matt, yeah. Spike prototype That's right. That's right. It's spiked in the sense that it focuses on one very narrow thing. It's like um, this part of the system. How would Node.js? How would we handle this issue of authentication in Node.js? Or, or to what degree does React play with um, uh, telemetry? Um, or you know, how do we handle? Um, uh, the the, uh, the interaction of this database with our with our uh, middleware strategy, and so you're focused on just that. It's it's not you're not trying to prototype out the whole system. 
you're, you're going into one very specific thing. How do these two play together for the operations we need? Um, and that's something that's really good to do early because it can head off risk. It can head off risk that, you know, in ID3, things don't play together nicely and you're in trouble. Um, ladies and gentlemen, if I have one more lecture to give, one more lecture to give as part of this course, it will probably be a lecture that I've delivered for many of past sessions of 371. You will find me online giving it uh, uh, in video, of course, um, uh, if anyone's interested in watching it. But it's about the system's nature of, of projects. And what you find is that quality is issue of quality is not just another attribute like the size of the software, its quality, and cost. In fact, quality, software quality is something that has some unique features associated with it. A failure to attend to software quality tends to end up hurting all parts of what's known as the iron triangle. And on a blackboard, in a room not far from here, in the opening days of the semester, I spoke to you, ladies and gentlemen, of the Iron Triangle. Um, and since then, your projects have spoken to me. Yes, of the Iron, and sometimes Rusty Iron Triangle. Um, yeah, so ladies and gentlemen, remind me, um, what are the vertices of this triangle? Pointed though they are. Yes, Matt. Uh, cost, quality, Co and time. Yeah, cost, quality, uh, and I'm going to come back to this. It's sometimes, uh, some people say scope. I don't think that's as good, but value is something I like here. Um, and, but quality has, has some good features and time. And what's the significance of this iron triangle? Okay, yeah, so there's a three arbitrary thing, you know. Yes? Balancing it is very difficult, um, mm. and there's usually some pretty significant trade-offs depending on which one you're trying to maximize for or which one. Good, <laughs> good. So Mesa, uh, your, your answer contains many useful elements, and one of them is you're trying to you use the word maximize. So There's kind of a normative thing. You're wanting to achieve these things. These are goodies you want to get. You want to figure it, finish your project, uh, you know, with less costs to the customer. Um, uh, you don't want them to cut it off because they're spending uh, too much on it. Um, you don't want to, you to have to bear a lot of costs as a software development organization to deliver this. The flip side of that, um, you'd like to do so with with economies, um, so uh, you can do so quickly, elegantly, and with a modicum of effort only. Um, time, you want to be able to finish it on time, and you want to be able to finish it with uh, appropriate levels of, of, of value. Now, I'm going, I emphasize value here because quality, ladies and gentlemen, can actually help all three of these. these. If you think of this as value delivered, Quality is one of these pervasive things. It cuts across all elements of it. Uh, Cost-wise, uh, if the quality isn't there, you're going to be spending a lot more time chasing down bugs, doing up extra rounds of testing you wouldn't otherwise have had, had to do. You're going to be rewriting code. You're going to be working things out with the stakeholder for clarifications or requirements that could have been caught earlier. You're going to be potentially throwing away elements of your design, et cetera. That's going to cost. It's also going to take time. And it's going to impede the delivery of value for the stakeholder to be unable to run important use cases uh, that they value um, within the, uh, the final product. And quality is one of these things that there's many things in life, ladies and gentlemen, which are harder to quantify um, but have profound impact, and, and quality is, is one of these. It's not to say you can't have any quantifications related to it. In fact, you can. In fact, 
I, I taught you mechanisms, several in fact, for defect estimation, to try to estimate you know, number of undiagnosed defects. But quality is one of these things that it's, it's less easy for a manager, for example, to pick up, particularly a manager not from technical background, than time and cost. People see the time passing. They see the money being spent. But often they can't see the quality. And one of the biggest dangers is you can fool yourself into thinking the quality is good by, by not probing it with the right instruments, testing-wise. And you can be lulled into a false sense of complacency, sometimes, ladies and gentlemen, even hubris, um, to thinking you know, you're doing really well, when in fact, what's accumulating behind the scenes, what breeding in the background, are lots and lots of bugs. And it's very ambiguous, isn't it? If there's few bugs being reported, is that a good sign? Or is it, ladies and gentlemen, an ominous sign that the testing is not reaching its mark? It, is it a sign that that um, you're just missing a lot of the defects out there. Quality has one of these pervasive roles. It's tied in with morale, ladies and gentlemen. It's tied in with fatigue. It's tied in with turnover on projects. It's tied in with the ability to attract good people. People don't like working with crappy code bases. People don't like struggling with systems that are just written in spaghetti code and they feel like they're, you know, um, they feel like they're constantly just struggling to make ends meet for even simple changes because it's like a game of whack-a-mole. And they leave for better opportunities. And who leaves for better opportunities especially? The more talented members of the team in terms of the technical knowledge. And often it leaves the remaining team members to pick up the pieces. They bring on new people, new hires who are not up to speed yet, and whose code quality is therefore less good. There's constant overhead to, to hire new people. People's morale is also worn down because with such a high amount of turnover, things have to be written down ad nauseum, and uh, rather than being kept in people's heads. A good gel team, a team that's, that um, produces good quality code can be an exceptional experience to work in. A team with low quality, low quality uh, code um, is often associated with low morale, high turnover, high amounts of burden associated with it, um, uh, inability to deliver on time or on budget or with the requisite qual quality uh, levels of quality or value, perceived value, and often at risk of stakeholder um, uh, canceling a project or being unhappy with the project. Um, so quality has this sort of central component in the dynamics of projects. It drives project dynamics like few other features, like few other elements. I'm tempted to stand here and, and hold forth for hours, but I will spare you that. Um, there's also this issue, an interesting issue with software engineering. Of, look, software engineering is not merely a matter of uh, bits and bytes and the programming language used in the, the detail constructs, as beautiful as, as important as those are. It's not merely a matter of using the right architecture, the right design. It's not a matter merely of of decomposing the system according to principles of separation of concern, separating out, for example, the database layer from the middleware, from the, from the front end, in a way that allows flexibility and testing and, and uh, capacity to mock out components and, and all that good stuff. I love that stuff, too. That, too, fires my heart. But that's not all. Software engineering, ladies and gentlemen, is a matter of the human theater. And people are part of these systems. Some engineers don't 
don't see it early on because uh, there's so much to, to, to marvel about at the technical level. But one of the things that makes software engineering projects so fascinating and at the same time so daunting is the fact that people are part of the system. We're dealing here with a system that um, where uh, personalities and division of responsibilities and ability to coordinate is every bit as important as the programming language we use, the testing environment which we apply, and uh, the details of the architecture. We are dealing here, ladies and gentlemen, with optimizing human systems. Mark my words. I had said from the front of 124 one memorable afternoon, memorable for me, probably ladies and gentlemen, not for you, that, that if there were one thing you could learn from this class, it could be argued that the most important thing is the principle that when something goes wrong, rather than engaging in self-castigation and, and regret and, and, uh, and uh, or denial, um, it's a healthy attitude, how can we do better next time? How could we have headed this off? Um, how, or how could we head this off in the future, similar problems? Or if it's going to occur, how could we find these problems faster? If you have a defect within your system, within your code bases, even if you never fix it, one thing you can do of great significance is fix your process. The process that, that excellently gave rise to it. Maybe it was a misunderstanding between team members, an inability to, uh, to, to fully communicate a requirement. Maybe it was uh, a, uh, a lack of understanding of the technology by someone. Maybe it was fatigue on the project. Another thing that is so tied up with quality. Fatigue breeds low quality. And ladies and gentlemen, low quality. Fatigue in turn. They're tangled in a most unseemly and reciprocal fashion. And ladies and gentlemen, um, there are many drivers for defects in the system. Identifying what left us vulnerable and what can we do better. Um, it's one of the most valuable things you can do, even if the defect is never fixed. Um, you can ask, how to avoid it next time? And how could we have detected it sooner to prevent it from wreaking its havoc? Okay? Um, so, so just remember that. Give me, give me some um, practical reasons you might not fix a defect if you saw it. Um, okay, so so it 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 may be that um, what what's the downside of fixing the defect? It can breed yeah. The, so fi attempted bug fixes often trigger new bugs. And the statistics I gave you were daunting. You may not remember them, so uh, I'll just remind you that even for very small defects, um, there's uh, a high chance uh, that uh, they'll introduce uh, a new defect, even for fixing small defects that are less than, fewer than 10 lines of code. Um, for large fixes, something like uh, 50 lines or more, it's like an 80% chance a new defect will be introduced. Um, and Work them well. Um, then I'll reciprocate in turn. Like that. Um, that when we get <laughs> way back. Um, so uh, when when it goes to fixing defects, 
one of the dangers is not just it may introduce new bugs, but we may not have time to find those new bugs. And the new bugs may not be familiar to us um, uh, as this one is. This one is a known, it's a known bug. It's the devil we know. We can document it. We can, we can mention it and work around. We can um, set expectations on the part of the users. What we may introduce may not be found. We may not have time to do another round of testing. Amanda may not have the time to do those, you know, heavy manual tests following this, this checkup. And so sometimes forbearance and, and uh, a bit of, uh, uh, you know, a bit of caution actually pays itself off because um, you, may, you may have avoided much worse issues that you didn't even know about, you didn't even find when it was delivered to your user. Indeed. Um, so, so, ladies and gentlemen, um, those are some reasons you might want to weigh on about fixing the defect. Does it mean you can't fix anything? No, fix your process. Fix, fix, fix it so that it's less likely to produce a defect similar to this in the future. Okay, let's talk about a couple of specific issues. Those are some general things, but trying to draw out important points here. Um, requirements gathering. So it, it's hard to argue for an almost preeminent position for requirements. Um, Requirements just feed so many things within the project, whether it's the design or the tests, um, particularly things like acceptance tests, but also system tests. Um, the very notion of value is one tied up in meeting the requirements. Um, and uh, you know, having, having a firm sense of, of, of requirements uh, can help a project go well having a poor sense of requirements is one of the kisses of death. Um, in case you folks uh, would find it interesting, I have on my bookshelf a book called 77 Surefire, Surefire Ways to Kill a Software Project. And uh, you know, one of the surest ways is like poorly understood requirements. And I've done consulting for software companies that have um, fallen victim uh, to this issue. Um, we talked about structured elicitation. And look, I, I'm looking for practical tips here. I mean, one of them is, look, re repeat back what you heard in your own language. Or have different people on the team that are eliciting it, um, you know, each say what, what each of them heard. Have multiple people present so that if something is said, it's more likely it's picked up. Rephrase it when you state it back so that you're not just parroting the words back without knowing what they mean. Say, I think what you meant in, in lay language is this, and they may say, oh, no, 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 you know, this, this is a very specific meaning in, in our terminology, in, in the language of accounting. When we say this, it, it, it has a very specific meaning that, that it's not part of what, what you heard. So many times what seem to us vernacular sort of informal terms turn out to actually be really structured, structure, have structured meaning. Um, uh, you know, this is a political process, like being clear who you're asking from, which stakeholders giving the requirements is often critical. And often you begin with a problem statement, like what's the gap? Problem statements like what's the gap between what is now and what could be? Um, and you you, uh, you use that to, to guide an understanding of where this project is, is coming from. Um, sources of error, I mean, uh, failure to recall, uh, failure to understand uh, multiple terms, uh, hearing different things from different stakeholders, um, uh, failing to, to capture it uh, as it was being said. Um, these, are, these are some sources of errors. Um, and expectations. I said one of the most important things in this class is actually the importance of setting expectations. Same deliverable, same client, same amount of time may be viewed as a grand success or a dismal failure, depending on the expectations of the client whom you deliver. If they expected it 10 times earlier, they may be hopping mad getting that same deliverable. If they were expecting something would take a bit longer than it did and you deliver early, they'd be happy. It's just a lot of the difference is 
and expectation setting. You hear all these statistics out of software engineering, software development, about how many projects, for example, are over budget or over time. You hear all these stories about, you know, 80% uh, of software projects are over time and so on. But you should pause to think, does that mean the project's a failure? Does that mean there were unrealistic expectations pushed on it, schedule-wise, that it just didn't happen to measure up to? Is it, in short, a problem with the project, or is it, in short, a problem with the expectations that were forced upon it by higher-level management? I'm not saying all projects that, that suffer suffer because of, of uh, you know, unjust uh, schedules pushed upon them. Far be it for me to suggest that, even with projects in this term. Um, but, um, but there's no question that, that um, sometimes projects are, are, are done a disservice by unrealistic expectations being pushed upon them. Um, to which they are measured up in a most um, um, uh, un, you know, um, inappropriate fashion. Gosh, we talked about a lot of best practices. Oh. Conscious, proactive, risk scanning and management. Speak to me, youths. What is meant by risk scanning? Yes, Beth. Yes. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So you're scanning for risks that were identified earlier and you, you want to see if they're coming about. Like there may be a danger that someone's burning out or maybe that person is out of touch for a while, maybe they're going to drop the course. Um, and, and you're looking for those risks coming about. You're looking for new types of risk as well. So maybe you're starting to work with, you know, with electronics and you're looking for a new type of risk that might accompany that based on misunderstanding. Or, or you know, you're starting to do more sophisticated work with VR involving, um, uh, involving uh, voice recognition. And there's a risk that the Python libraries involved are, 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 are under-documented and therefore it may take a while to, to, to be able to, to get up to speed in them or what have you. Um, Accountable positions, having clear positions of responsibility, who's responsible for what within a project uh, is, is important. It's not a silver bullet, it's not like it solves all problems, but if you don't have this, if you know who's taking charge of you know, the testing on this, or who's, who's maintaining the build, it is a way of not getting done, of leading to misunderstandings or recriminations. Needless conflict, ladies and gentlemen. Needless conflict, gratuitous conflict. Conflict that wasn't needed can be generated sometimes by, by emissions. Peer reviews, we talked a lot about peer reviews. Um, give me four different types of peer reviews. That. Peer testing, peer programming. Okay, so, so I like that, actually. Uh, peer testing, absolutely. And sometimes we distinguish between pair testing and buddy testing. What, what's, what's, what's buddy testing? Anyone? Yes, Mason. Um, would that be uh, like, say, kind of working uh, in similar areas but not necessarily on the same thing? Okay. It, 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 you know, often it is associated with that, Eileen. Good. So A, A and B are running code, A writes test for B, B writes test for A. Why do that? Yeah. It, look, when A writes test for their own code, often they have the same misunderstandings in mind that they incorporate in the code. So the test, test, test things on the wrong assumptions, or the same assumptions that are used in the code, which may sometimes be right, but sometimes wrong. And it's less likely that both a and B will make the same mistakes. Um, uh, and so having each other test each other's code is good. Also, people tend to test their code in sympathetic ways. They test the code to make sure it works. Like, okay, yeah, that's working, ain't it? Um, okay, time to move on. You test someone else's code that isn't 
always the case that you test those simple type of times. Um, and so it's, it's less likely you'll reflexively be testing to show that it works. Sometimes you don't even, um, you know, not even, you know, not even have the same idea in mind of what it will mean to work correctly. So you might test different things. Um, so by contrast, pair testing is actually um, normally defined as sort of two people together. Um, you know, like I, I'm testing together with you, just like it might be pair programming. Maybe two people are sitting uh, next to each other and coming up with ideas for tests together and writing tests. And, and they're brainstorming about tests. Oh man, we can check this. Or let's get an assertion in there and we'll check this other thing um, uh, in ways that could be uh, helpful. Um, so uh, pair testing, pair programming, I've heard those types of peer reviews. What other things? Yes. Artifact reviews? Uh, yeah, so there's type, several types of artifact reviews. And it's good to use some uh, specific names. Um, uh, there's a thing called an inspection, which um, everyone should have undergone in, in, in one variance or another. Um, uh, yeah. Walkthroughs? Walkthroughs is another thing. Structured walkthroughs. And structured walkthroughs are a bit like inspections, but a, a step less formal. For example, they might not involve um, a separate follow-up phase where someone's been tasked with fixing a bunch of things and then that gets checked. Or you might not have a different presenter than the author. So often in inspections, the best practice is the author of the, of the item is there, but they're not the person who presents them. There's a, another presenter. Whereas in walkthroughs, generally the person who, who created it presents it. Um, uh, so those are those are good um, good types. Peer desk checks. Someone saying, "Hey, can you take a look at this? What do you think? Could you did this? Uh, get rid of what have you? You know, take take a look and, and let me know what you think. Did I miss any uh, important cases? Uh, you're the one, maybe who wrote the." Some of the code that I'm calling from this, make sure I'm using that in the right way, not on base. Um, different levels of formality. You should know how these differ, like different in what ways. Um, generally, like like an inspection, how does that differ from a pure desk check? That's some, some sense of public here. Um, incremental delivery. Why do we deliver things in increments? Small increments. It's easier to find defects or uh, missed requirements or misunderstandings. Good. Yeah, we can we can iterate back to the stakeholders. So that's uh, that's that's a good one. Um, sometimes stakeholder needs change, and if the needs change, delivering things in pieces allows them to always say, "What's the next priority?" Sometimes the thing that was really low down earlier uh, ends up being a bigger priority. Um, uh, incremental deliverables tend to mean less chance that it'll just get dragged out more and more and more and more requirements to be layered on because more and more things are changing on the part of the client or they want more and more value because of how long it's taking. If you do things in incremental deliverables, they're getting value along the way. Um, and hopefully some of the highest value delivery is early. But often it's, as Mesa said, identifying if you're off base. It's like, oh, that wasn't what I want. Um, okay, well, given that's where you're at, well, it, what I really want is this extra thing right now. At least get that in place. But here are many Muslims, like, are, is this done, is this not done? And have a clear notion of what it means to be done with the development test. Give me a couple things that, when you say like, okay, I'm done with this task involving, let's say, coding. What, give me some things that that means other than, yeah, I wrote the code for it. Yeah, and that passes some sort of acceptance test. Good, yeah, it passes at least some, uh, maybe it's a method, it passes uh, some unit tests maybe, yeah, good, excellent. Uh, another thing, yeah, I think. Yeah, any, any design documentation about this so that it's an as-built design document. Other things. Maybe running a style check on it. Or otherwise committing it, it's a good thing. 
making sure it passes with the smoke test, making sure critically that you've executed on all pull requests and you've got all the refreshed code base to test this against because it's got to play nicely with all the code, hopefully just a little bit. That's been done in the past since you started work on it. By the way, you can see with incremental deliverable, um, particularly with continuous integration, if you've only taken a little bit of time to do this work, a fraction of a day, not much has changed with respect to other things. So the likelihood that your contribution will break with other things when it tries to play together will be lesser. But if, if you're working on something for weeks on end and then you check it in, there's more chance that it will run across purposes to other things that have been checked in since. So, so having that testing of it with that, with that code base is, uh, and it is good. Uh, with the rest of the code base. Um, okay. Um, so, yeah, uh, continuous integration and, and smoke test. What's the deal with a smoke test? How does that, what, what's the job of a smoke test compared to any old uh, other type of test? Yeah, Matt. It ensures the system can even function without crashes. Yeah. Like yeah, the basic deal of the smoke test is look, tests, tests in general are kind of made to, to identify. Uh, defects in the system, but a smoke test has a special job of like asking, is the system in such an unstable state that you don't even want people to get the code base, right? It's, it's like, if it's so broken that people are not going to be able to operate with it, not going to be able to run other tests, like through the UI, not be able to log into it, whatever, um, we, we need to put a hold on, you know, the getting all the updates from this. We need to roll back this latest check until it's fixed. Uh, we need to get this fixed, in short. So a smoke test is kind of a sanity check on the state of the system to make sure this latest check-in or a combination of check-ins that occurred almost the same time didn't host the system. Um, it's not so much ferreting out where exactly is a new bug as like, whoa, sanity check, this thing is, is just not in a very stable state. So you're you're often adding to the smoke test. It's more of a kind of system level test and adding to it to make sure it's testing the features out at a rough level so you can spot any big issues, right? Um, meetings, I don't think I need to go on. Meetings are valuable. In-person meetings are, are, are especially valuable. Testability, how do I, how do I enhance testability of the system? Matt, give me some ideas. Yeah. Modular code, proper name. Yeah, logging, another good thing. Test interfaces like uh, uh, like a, a special debug console or, or debug window. Uh, test hooks. Yeah, what's, what's the deal with a test hook? Yeah. It's implemented in your code so that if you're in game, you can, I don't know, push a button or something and see the state of the system. Yeah, yeah exactly. Look, so there's a lot of function. I mean, normally we think of writing code for the sake of delivering on the core functionality of the system, and that's fine. But sometimes we want to write code that will make it easier to evaluate or to test or to, to debug, right? Um, and generally this falls in the area of, of test hooks, which contribute a lot to testability. Because sometimes it behooves us, like if we have a big algorithm that's running, to be able to know, is it in a good state in the middle of that algorithm that's really valuable? And if you just look at the you know, inputs and outputs, it may not be so clear where is it going off base or is it working at certain key components. But if you have test hooks, you can kind of get this extra way of peering in and seeing what's going on. Test hooks provide us a way sometimes of simulating error, errors. You know, like, so we, you know, in order to see if our system works when um, the disk is full, we don't have to actually fill up our desk. We, we tell it basically, hey, Take it on, take my word for it. The disk is full. Now do something. Try it. Um, and we we see how well does it work for that, or there's a network timeout, or there's congestion, or what have you. It provides us with ways to test it better and test it more intelligently, right? Um, and there's a whole suite of ways of doing this. Some of them it's good design. Separation of concerns is key one. What's separation of concerns? Spoke earlier about that. Yes. Um, using more functionality into different logins. Yeah, 
different types of functionality is placed in different places, and it's placed in different areas of the system. So you have different areas of the system that have a different focus, a different job of life to do. So you have some that are focused on the UI, some that are focused on the database, some that are focused on the network layer, some that are focused on the core business logic, for example. Or you might have um, some areas of the system that encapsulate cross-cutting functionality. This is the idea of the aspect-oriented program, like logging or transaction support or security that cut across all the areas. And you, by encapsulating those in one place, it lets people with certain expertise focus on those areas. Um, you're not thinking of all things at once and dealing with a certain area. You don't have this hairball of sort of tangled, tangled interactions between you know, transactions and security and logging and issues with you know, the UI tangled up with the back end, tangled up with the business logic. That way, ladies and gentlemen, Shakespeare said it first. Lies madness. Yes. The modularity you say is no separation. Of yeah. Yeah. So a separation of concerns basically takes advantage of modularity. It takes advantage of modularity in a very specific way. Very good question. It 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 segregates out. It it separates out into different modular units, different types of concerns, different types of needs associated with the system, and by so doing. Um, it allows uh, for a sort of focus on the part of the developer at any one time on, on one set of, of set of needs, a set of technologies, et cetera. Um, and by the way, this also has all the benefits often of modularity, right? Like you can swap in something out so that, oh, you, you know, okay, we don't want to run it with a database layer, or we'll replace the database layer with a logging layer. And it has the same interface, but it will log instead of actually putting it in the database. Or instead of having UI input in the, did you folks learn model view controller mechanisms, right? So, so you have a, a, a controller component that might normally be a keyboard. Um, and maybe we substitute it to take input from a, you know, from a script instead that puts you know, or, you know, a file that tells us input to feed to the system. That's what we can achieve through separation of concerns with modularity. We can substitute in things for you know, areas of the system that are grouped together. So, so that's, that's good. Um, test case formulation is a huge thing. Uh, continuous and period geodic. Defect estimation, we talked about three approaches, you know them. Uh, uh, test driven uh, testing, look, there's opportunity cost. You can't test everything. Test intelligently. Boundary values. Equivalence classes. That's at least a one or two or three items in each equivalence class. I mean, like how can you say you tested a square root function if you never tested it with a non-square value? You test it with four. You test it with nine. You test it with sixteen. You don't declare victory and go home, if it's doing it of doubles, you want to test it with some things that are not perfect squares. Maybe you want to test it with zero and one as kind of particularly fixed points to the square root operator. Or maybe you want to test it with a negative value to see what error message it gives. Remember to test it with things that cause errors as well as things that should, should uh, elicit um, you know, good results too. Um, expected. Um, has as well. Um, to do more version control practices, uh, you know, uh, putting in place uh, pull requests that are of a modest size and, and, and uh, smaller, smaller in their scope. Um, test driven development, uh, writing tests up front often sharpens your thinking about what's needed, and time estimation. Um, uh, I tied in with the notes in a box in. What is time boxing? Time box. Yeah. Uh, getting a certain amount of time for a specific task and just kind of yeah. yeah. Sticking about that. So so in, in traditional software there was a notion look, well aim for this time, but we'll get this functionality done. If it takes longer 
it'll take a bit longer, but what's the invariant is we'll deliver this functionality. Time boxing turns that around and says, look, you've got a week, or two weeks, or three. Up in, uh, around town, you'll find you know, one to three week sprints in various companies. And you, that's the amount of time you got. How much can you do during that time? And you throttle your work for you know, according. Um, so it's like the, the, it's boxed by time rather than boxed by functionality. So we know how long it's going to take. The question is, how much do we put in there? How many of these features do we have? And companies will use like jelly beans to count out what features they put in. This is a three jelly bean feature. This is a two. This is a, another two. This is a one. Um, which ones can we do for this next release? Um, uh, learning from, from, from mistakes. Uh, throw away prototypes and, and spike prototypes is a special example. Okay, risk management. Um, a uh, bunch of different ways to do it risk management. Sometimes you accept the risk. You just say, look, we know this is a risk. We thought about it. Um, we'll keep an eye out for it, but fundamentally we accept, uh, accept this risk. Two big ones, though, I really want to emphasize are contingency planning and mitigation. What's the difference between the two? Uh, mitigation is uh, before it materializes and Good. And, and what does it seek to do? This is an important point. So it uh, reduces the likelihood of the, of the risk materializing. Good, good so man. That's actually one of two things. Reducing impact. Or reducing impact if it hadn't. So it's two forms, actually, two variants you'll find. Sometimes it is both of, of, of risk mitigation strategies. Basically, they make it either, they, they lower the risk exposure. What is the risk exposure? It's often quantified as probability times damage if it happens. And, um, and so uh, mitigation strategies can either make it less likely this will happen, or if it does happen, how make it less serious. And you can, but the point is you invest ahead of time. You, you, you actually put something in place to reduce those. By contrast, what is contingency plan? Yes. Uh, you do after the risk materializes. Yeah, yeah, but the key thing is you have a, a coordination plan. So you have a plan, if this is coming about, we'll undertake this. So everyone's on the same page with it. You know, everyone's the same page, okay, if this happens, this is how we're gonna handle it. And so if it does come about, it's you know, scrambling and trying to figure out, okay, who's gonna do what and you know, uh, who's gonna take responsibility for this? You have a, a key idea in mind, you know, who's taking the lead, um, we're going to know where the resources are, we're going to put in place um, this this meeting schedule, we're going to um, contact these people and, and get it uh, work to resolve it. And so it just allows a lot more coordination. Okay? Um, risk management is an explicit ongoing process. It's something that requires ongoing um, prioritization, particularly for this risk scanning, which we spoke about. Uh, earlier, um, and uh, you know, often there's early on, but hopefully on an ongoing basis, some sort of uh, brainstorm about what the risks are. Um, okay, I want to talk about contracts, code contracts. This is actually pretty important. And, um, I want to make sure you folks recognize the importance. I, I put on these. Your code suggests that you do, um, and I appreciate that. Um, so I won't dwell on it uh, exhaustively, but I'll, I'll just say, look, contracts specify what can be counted on with respect to code. Um, and for methods, these are generally preconditions, uh, postconditions, and sometimes invariants. Um, preconditions are, what is this so if this is a method or a function, what does it need to do its job? It needs to be passed, these things, these ones need to be non-null, this has to be, you know, there's all integers i and j, i and j both have to be greater than or equal to zero and less than the size of the array and j has to be greater than i, right? It specifies what it needs to do a job to be called legitimately. And if 
Thus assured, post conditions are guaranteed. If the preconditions are guaranteed, there's two lines of thinking about it, but there's an important line of thinking that look, preconditions say what I'm counting on, um, and you can't count for me in, in ensuring these post conditions unless the preconditions are met. If the preconditions are not met, all bets are off. It's your responsibility to to adhere to the preconditions when you call me. Um, so if, if you're calling method A, method A has certain preconditions. Method A will assure those conditions are met as long as you provide it the requisite preconditions. Um, an invariant may be, for example, that um, it uh, returns values which are guaranteed to, you know, maybe it's a triplet of values, uh, maybe A, B, and C, where uh, A and B are two, uh, you know, two uh, lists or two vectors, um, and um, uh, C is the vector that's the concatenation of them, and uh, none of those uh, within a given vector there's never a repeat of a given element or something along those lines. Um, for class as a whole, we talk about invariance and history properties. Um, uh, we don't really talk about preconditions except for like a, a constructor, for example. Um, we will talk about that. Um, invariant, what's the difference between an invariant and a history property? Anyone remember? I went over this pretty quickly. I want to be sure you folks are proud of it. Because I can see the pretty important. Um, what's the difference between a, a, a invariant and a history property? Anyone? An invariant is something that at any one time is true. At any point, you can check it. Right now, this invariant has to be true. So this internal data structure has no duplicates. There are or, that data structure has no empty keys or null keys. It has no entries in it which are null. Um, uh, you know, it's of uh, size greater than zero. Um, these, are, these are invariant. These are things that are true at any one time. You could freeze time and check them. History properties are things that compare the, the state of that, that class, or data structure, what have you, at two different times. And often it's things like it doesn't reduce in size. Or, what's a key history property? I spoke to you of it in admiring tones on one of our final days. That it's immutable, ladies and gentlemen. That it doesn't change. That once built, it's a, as we call it, a value object. And value objects may seem strange. It's like, well, what? You're restricting what it can do in life, so surely you impoverished it. But in fact, value objects are incredibly valuable. Because you don't have to worry they're going to mutate on, out from under you. So if you're worried about threading, you have multiple threads, and they share the same value object, you know one's not going to you know, uh, mess with it in a way that will screw up the other. One's not going to update it in a way that the other will be thrown off. Um, uh, value objects are great because you can have multiple references to them without worrying that one will stomp on the other. Um, and so you don't have to copy them. Whereas things that are mutable, often you end up copying defensively. Like if you take in something that's a date object, you know date in Java is, is mutable? Did you know that? Or no wonder they largely tried to deprecate it as if Java eight or nine. Um, with calendar objects and so on. But if, if you take an object that's a date past them, you can't just take that reference and stick it internally and say, oh, that's the date associated with the data structure. That's the date I was created. Why, why not? Because someone outside might still have the reference and might mutate it later. Now suddenly they're mutating your internal guts, which is both sounds both unpleasant and in fact in practice it is. Um, and um, and so you have to make a defensive copy just in case somewhere out there they're holding a reference to it. By contrast, if it's an immutable object, you pass it in immutable and, and you don't have to worry about that. But ladies and gentlemen, 
I had tongue not to give extra lectures in this course. Um, that was also on the docket. So. Um, um, oh yeah, this is really, really important. For contracts, for code contracts and specifications, they provide value, ladies and gentlemen. If I, have a, if I have a piece of code, it has a contract associated with it, saying my preconditions and postconditions, let's say for a let's be simple. Preconditions, post conditions. Mm. So someone else can call this method on me and they know the preconditions and post conditions. Why does that confer value to them? Because it, uh, it, it allows them to know that the mm -hmm. function will go on mm -hmm. exactly what it's That's right. So at the time of creation, they're very clear what it guarantees. And by, by extension, what it doesn't guarantee. Like maybe this is a sort routine and they don't know, does this, how does that handle ties, uh, for example? Um, uh, you know, is it guaranteed that they're in the original order, for example? Um, um, uh, and, and they see, okay, they're clear on what this they can count on right now and using it, and that's great because it's always um, uh, it's always good to have you know a clarity when you're writing this code. But even more critically, as there as as time goes on, they don't have to worry that you'll change it out from under them because these are contracts; it's guaranteed. So you may you know if if they're using this and they're calling off to this they don't have to worry that someone's going to rewrite that code in a way that will suddenly break their code because they're only counting on things that are guaranteed in the contract and the contract will stay in place even if the code the implementation evolves of the thing they're calling so they can rest assured that as time goes on their code will still work because it's counting on things that are guaranteed in the for the person who made this abstraction being called, the person who wrote this library function that's being called, why does it help them to have this in place, to have a contract? Yeah, yes, sir. Um, it forces them to make sure that, they, uh, that their implementation stays true to the original print yeah. post conditions. So yeah. they're not tempted to change things a little bit. Um, that's, that's right. So when they first write it, it gives clarity on what they need to accomplish, what they need to guarantee, what they, what they have to ensure. But as it evolves even more so, they know what they can change and what they can't. So look, there's tons of things they can change. They can make this a more efficient algorithm and so on, as long as they provide those guarantees. The guarantees that they provide have to be assured, but they could change the implementation language, they could change the details of the data structures internally or the algorithms used or what have you. A change, you know, add a cache to it, represent all sorts of things. As long as they maintain those guarantees, their users, the people who call them, shouldn't be unhappy. They'll, they'll still be using it well. So, modularity and contracts and specifications give benefits. But, you know, they offer a lot of other benefits conceptual clarity early opportunities for review of the detailed design. If you share these things out, people can see what these components uh, guarantee. You can directly derive many assertion checks, right? If there's a precondition for a method, inside the method, it can do an assertion check as a sanity check. Um, it can, even better for a post condition, it can confirm that post condition is true at the end. Just want to make sure we achieve what we've promised in the post condition. It's easier to generate test cases. It's often like very, very, very straightforward. Um, it's uh, easier to integrate multiple things. You can have people working on different areas of the program at the same time. I don't have to wait until that code is finished, right? I don't have to wait until the code is finished that you're writing because I see your contract. So I can write against your code and, and be ready to call your code even while your code is being written, right? I can create mocks more easily because I know 
what things are guaranteed, and actually in, in quite a few mocking frameworks, you can declare, like, check these preconditions, um, uh, for example, uh, at the beginning of it. So you can, you can get going and short on coding and mocking and testing earlier. Um, and, uh, you know, in some cases, you can have much, much more aggressive optimization. And these things take time to write, but they save a lot of time. Um, we as, as people often get too tied up in seeing the obvious costs of things, but the, the diffuse benefits that we tend to downplay. And so it is with quality. Um, and so it is with uh, code contracts. Okay, let's talk about fakes, mocks, and stubs. What's the job of a mock? Yes. To replicate uh, another piece of functionality. Yeah, it's kind of a doppelganger for this piece of functionality. It kind of, it kind of stands in for this. It pretends like it's one of these, right? And, and why would you do that? Isolation. Yeah, isolation is a good reason. So you'd like to be able to test A without testing everything it depends on. Maybe A calls B, C, and D, and D calls E and F, and A, and look, you just, you want to you test A in isolation. So, so we, we mock out the other things. We call up and they return values and we continue on to A. I shouldn't have said that D calls A. That makes it more interesting uh, as far as mocking. But D calls B, let's put it. Um, and, uh, and so the point is we can mock things out. We can do something that's closer to true unit testing. Um, testing just A in isolation, even though it depends on things. So that's a good reason to do mocking. What's another reason to do mocking? So suppose A depends on B, C, and D. And they depend on other things. Suppose they're not even yet fill in the blank. Yeah, they don't even exist. They're not even yet written. We can mock them out and we can still test A. Yeah. Uh, right. If you use mocking, uh, it gives you a chance to implement your own code if there's. Uh, I don't know if that would rely on. If your code relies on another piece of functionality, I guess. Mm -hmm. That needs to be. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So you can, you can focus on yours and not have to wait until those others are in place and. Uh, you could decouple the development, essentially. Um, uh, you know, it, it could also be that these other components are non-deterministic or slow. They're hard to get into the states that we want. And we want them to return, like we want a mock it to return a certain error message, right? And that will get our code to do a certain thing. So instead of like trying to twist the actual code to return that error message, you mock it out and have it return that error code. And then you see how your code responds to it, right? It's a bit of, of, of a hook of sorts. Um, now, I'm not going to be holding you responsible for these distinctions, but just be aware that generally mocks are referring to the more sophisticated version of this, um, things that will actually check context and can uh, state ahead of time and has to return things of a certain type and return random values or what have you, it should check these certain invariants, like it's only called once, or, or it's called with, with values in these ranges that can log messages, perhaps to different frameworks, et cetera. Um, we used to talk about stubs, particularly in the procedural world, like when, when C and C++, well, C particularly. And fakes are sort of a, a simplified uh, version of mocks. Um, testing. Um, yeah, there's, um, there's a testing pipeline. Often there's uh, testing that's occurring uh, at several points. There's test releases before the full release, ideally, that are testing successive uh, components of the system. Testing is more than just finding bugs. Why do I say that? What else is it besides identifying, you know, locating where the bugs are? What else is testing? Well, you may, look, testers are the first power users of the system. And they'll often identify issues that are not just bugs, but what? Usability. 
usability issues and big right? it's like I mean you got to go through that to do this certain task oh man that's painful or wait that looks really ugly when you're seeing it on Safari that looks horrible have you seen that they're actually identifying other sorts of quality problems or this is slow it's really really slow it's not a bug but it's a quality issue it's a software experience issue it's a software trouble incident, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so I introduced earlier this notion of, of uh, one bug can introduce, like trying to fix one bug can introduce other defects. And there's a notion called the fault feedback ratio, which is basically for each, for each defect you fix, how many new ones do you introduce? And commonly, it may be 0.2, 0.3, and, and often it's higher for larger amounts of code. I want to make a distinction that I remember making to you in the most emphatic way during the term. And I want to make sure that it sticks. Okay? Um, what is testing find? When you test, what do you look for? It's true, I've, I've mentioned some software experience issues, and that's really valuable for testing. You have someone like Amanda going through it, and she may identify um, software uh, trouble things of, of other sorts, but what is it finding? Yeah, what failures. Yeah, it's finding failures. It's finding, like, like in the most direct way, we say, I say testing finds defects, but that ain't true, really, because first it finds failures, and then to go from the failure to the defect that lies underneath it, the fault that underlies it, that's a process known as, begins with a D, debugging. Yeah, right, so testing finds failures, and, and then you have, to, you have to often go trace down why are you seeing this failure, is it a problem, you know, it, it, it wrote a corrupt file to disk. Is it an issue with uh, some in-memory corruption due to a loose pointer? Is it some issue with, with uh, you know, a, uh, a problem with, with the character set or what have you? By contrast, and, and I know this is not quite topical, but this is so important, a, it's so important a point that I want to come back to it. With peer review, we talked about peer review types earlier. What does peer review find? Like, think about inspection. What does that find? Yeah, Matt. Errors and requirements documents designed by so That's right. So it can be conducted earlier. You can't test those things. You can't run tests on the requirements. But it's also much better uh, time. Yeah. Yeah, and, and one of the key reasons is because instead of finding failures, peer review finds, often finds the underlying fault. And I know this is painful. Um, uh, defines the underlying fault, um, not not merely the failure. Um, you know, you, you, you're peer reviewing code, you're inspecting code, and you see perhaps it does not handle a certain case properly. Oh, wow, that is much appreciated. Let's see if. Uh, yeah, that, that didn't help too much. Good man. It's okay, Good. I stole it from some, somewhere else, I don't know. Um, I'm known to distribute these around this building. Um, <laughs> I, I think I'm the preeminent supplier of pens. <laughs> um, and and uh, they diffuse. Maybe this is, maybe I need to carve my initials. <laughs> and I can trace them like all the bills I use. Um, uh, anyway, uh, oh, what am I doing? <laughs> That's horrible. <laughs> Which run is wrong? Um, that could be a good question on the exam. Um, I'm glad this isn't a video. Um, so, which one is incorrect? Peer reviews. Yeah, peer reviews. This should be false. This finds false often, or suspected false. This doesn't look right. It doesn't look like this is handled. So here you need debugging to really go, you know, with testing you need debugging here, right? Um, but peer review identifies these things clearly. 
Um, but you know, the truth is, these aren't in opposition. It's not like this is better than this. Now, it is true that efficiency-wise, as Matt mentioned, um, it turns out studies have suggested that in terms of the number of types of defects that can be found, well, testing is great. Peer reviews are greater in terms of what they can find. Inspections are stronger than, than what you can find with testing. And it's also true on a per defect basis found, it's cheaper, ladies and gentlemen, in terms of human time involved to do with peer review rather than testing. But the truth is, these are not intentional. These are not, it's not like you have to do one or the other. It's not like one is just better than the other and you shouldn't do testing. Of course not. In fact, I would argue peer review can help testing. Why? Give me an example of how peer review could, could help testing. Yeah, Matt. If you're doing a peer review, you could literally review another person's test cases, yeah. I guess. Precisely. And, and say, so, wait a minute, this is doesn't seem to be testing anything meaningful now after this latest change to the system. Or you might say, oh man, we could test something really significant if we just made this modification to the test, you could, you could catch this other thing. Uh, or it might give you ideas for new tests, right? Um, additional tests that can be done. Peer review can really help testing by reviewing tests and improving, creating new ones. What's another way it can help uh, testing? Uh, yeah, yeah, so it might be able to figure out um, how would we, like during a peer review or an inspection, you might say, how could we design a test that would reach this area of the code? Maybe it's, a, it's an area with uh, error conditions that are triggered by certain network timeouts or something. How can we test this effectively? Yeah, Matt. Do abstraction graphs and full test coverage? Yeah, exactly. Um, so, uh, really good. So, yeah, you might do peer review over diagrams of the software showing paths and, and uh, identify uh, testing, um, and, and that would open up opportunities for tests. Was there a hand for well? Yeah. yeah. I don't know if this is what you're getting at, but I mean, identifying stuff early in a peer review means it's less time wasted by the testers. That's, yeah. that's exactly right. So you don't have to, you, you use the testing for where it's most helpful. Now, there are certain things that it's much, easier to test with. There's certain types of logical situations or race conditions, et cetera. You might be able to find with testing just sort of brute force, right? Through through large amounts of random tests or or uh, tests within uh, large amounts of, of uh, generating uh, situations where you know what the answer is, that it might be hard to, to do with peer review. But it lets the testing shine in areas where it's best for it. So peer review can help, can help head off the need for tests. Um, peer review can, can also give, give a sense of where the tests are, you know, where we really need a test for this. It's like, I don't know if that's gonna work um, for, for this, uh, this parallel uh, ca uh, case. Let's, let's, uh, let's write some tests that will, will probe that issue. Um, so peer review can often motivate tests uh, as well. Um, peer review will sometimes identify code that's really crafty, like it's code poor code quality. Could you imagine that? Like that might come out. Um, and uh, and and then you might test that code, right? That might be a key target for further testing because you know. Therein, ladies and gentlemen, lies Croft, right? And so you'll, you'll do that. Or how about another way? You might, through peer review, identify a method that's of ungainly size, an entangled character, whose very aspect is frightening to the eye. And you might identify opportunities for modularizing it in the peer review that then enhance the testing opportunities, right? That, that let it be more modular 
or you better clarify what's really going on in this code. Like, you're counting on those things being true? Let's, I don't even know that that's true in this area of the system where we have, you know, multilingual support. Let's put in place a bunch of assertions, right? I've just listed for you, ladies and gentlemen, perhaps approaching 10 different ways in which testing and peer review can work together, with peer review enhancing uh, testing. And um, I hope that will lend an appreciation for just how valuable they can be to undertake uh, together. Okay. Um, what is triage? So generally, we have so many things to communicate. It's a little time. Um, Galois said it first. Um, so, so we'll often illustrate a sort of the story of a bug's life, right? Um, uh, there's sort of undiagnosed defects. And undiagnosed defects, this is, this is like one of the most important collections of, of defects out there, the ones that are undiagnosed, that haven't been found yet, right? And I gave you a couple ways to estimate how big this is, right? These are like undiagnosed, right? And then there's a process of reporting where they go to this state of you know, reported defects, right? Mm -hmm. um, and reported defects are a kind of motley crew. This is kind of a, a jumble of things. And then we go through a stage by which we turn these into what are often called active defects. What are these? These are, what's this process called by which reported defects are rendered into active defects? I'll, I'll give you a hint. Active distinct defects, yes. Uh, sanitization. sanitization, that's darn right. Sanitization, right? Mm -hmm. um, Kareem? Yeah. yeah. Um, sanitization, what does is, what is this weed out? Like what things are here that don't make it through? Uh, yeah, Kareem. Good. That's a that's a key one. How about another one? Yeah. Well. Uh, like misunderstandings about the system. Yeah, misunderstandings about the system. How about another thing? Outdated. Yeah, outdated. Like they're they're old. They're old. Um, they might be they might be on platforms that it doesn't mean to support. Right. You know, this is on an iPhone four, and it really only supports iPhone six and above, and the person didn't know that. So you could argue that misunderstanding, but, uh, but the point is it's, it's not really a relevant, a relevant defect. But one of the key ones is you get a lot of repeats, a lot of repeats often. So then you sanitize and you get active defect. By the way, there's some in here that are also like, they're not even serious, like, like it's, it's just weird. <laughs> okay, sorry. I, that, that lacked uh, precision and, and both precision and elegance and exposition. But there are ones in here that are like, it's not clear that they mean to submit this, or it was a half-formed defect report that never really got, got described what it was. And um, in, in any case, uh, there, there's low quality stuff in here. And then you got to active defects. These ones are of real interest. And the count of these is a lot more meaningful than the count of that. Of course, this is the real, that's the big kahuna. Uh, in any case, then there's a process here of having prioritized defects. Um, and uh, these are ones that we're actually going to fix. And often there's a triage process here, okay, um, to, to to figure out which ones we're actually uh, going to fix. Um, I, I do this a bit of disservice, though, because there's actually two related processes that go by different names. There's a directed triage, 
which actually wades through these and promotes them. So I'll say directed triage um, and, and promotes them and, and which also will promote them on you know, getting fixed by particular developers. Um, so so we'll, we'll promote these on for, uh, for fixing. So developers will, will take them. Triage is deciding basically which of these is going to be fixed. Directed triage is like, okay, we've got to figure out how many bugs we have. And sometimes directed triage actually involves this entire thing. Like we're going to go through and sanitize these. Like how many defects do we really have? And so you end up going through and sort of undertaking both these processes. But this, this is a key part of, of the triage process to say, okay, which ones are we going to actually fix? It's prioritizing and saying, is this worth fixing? So triage is like you have two limited resources and you decide, how are we going to use this? We can't fix everything. Well, we'll put it into these couple bugs um, because they're you know, particularly problematic. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, I argue that there's two types of bugs which offer particular, that go by a name, a name, ladies and gentlemen, of shame. Um, that, that offer particularly deleterious consequence for users, and that you have to spot with particular, um, you, you put a special emphasis on spotting. These are a type of defect, a subset defect, that are called what? They are called, they begin with R. I, I, I exaggerate when I say they're shameful. It has a G in it. Regression. regression. Yeah. These are regression. Right? Um, it's a big E. Um, so, by the way, Mesa, this is awesome. This is awesome. I really appreciate it. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, what, what distinguishes regressions? Why are they of particular note and of particular concern? Yeah, so you uh, break a client's workflow? Mm hmm. So if they break a feature that previously worked for a client, it's not merely that this new version of the software didn't offer much added value. It's that we actually added negative value. We like took away things that they could do. So imagine you know getting you start using a new version of Google Docs and it it won't even read your pre-existing documents or it screws them up, right? Um, these features that used to work no longer work. That, that's a lot worse than having a, a new feature that just doesn't work. You know, you, I don't know, you, um, it, it, it integrates voice so you can talk over the document where you're collaborating on it or something with, with remote people. If that doesn't work, well, yeah, it's a bit of a letdown, but you know, you haven't lost anything. But if, if it breaks features you've been using, like tables are all screwed up, uh, you've added negative value, you've subtracted value. So that's one use of regression. There's actually another use of regression that's of more technical concern within a project. Can anyone speak of it? Regression, the term regression is also used if an earlier defect returns, an early reported defect returns. Um, a defect that, that um, we thought was fixed reemerges. Okay. Um, and for this reason, because, because these types of defects are of particular concern, are of particular seriousness, we perform regression testing. And regression testing involves checking the features that have been working continue to work. And that covers both those types of defects, right? The, we're, we're, we're trying to avoid breaking features that should work, if they've been working for a while. And we're trying to avoid features that have been working because the defect was fixed, re reoccurring that defect. Why might we have these weird defects that reappear? Why, why are we 
particular concern, but a defect that reappears. Why could that happen? Yes, Mason. Uh, because you've got like whatever module that defect is emanating from. For some reason, it's like the problems that you fixed in the past aren't actually being fixed, meaning that there's some greater problem that you haven't identified. With. Yeah, and sometimes you play whack a mole and you know this has changed from zero to one, and then it breaks something else over there, and some other developer comes along and, and tries to fix that thing, and they say, oh, I, I just have to meet just, oh, it was one? Why was it one? Change it back to zero. And this other one, and it just shifts the problem back. And this happens, right? You squeeze the balloon here, it pops out there, and you squeeze it. Um, uh, so this, this happens. There's another reason, too. With merge conflicts and so on, right? You have you have people roll back to an earlier version of it, or you know, I check in my so you check in your code, you think you fix this defect. I've been modifying some overlapping code. I'm not very careful dealing with the merge conflict, and so I slap my code on top of some of yours and it reverts it. That defect was fixed for a day or two, and then suddenly it goes back because I reinstituted it because my code is working with uh, the older version of the function you fixed. Could that happen? It can, it can. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, regression tests um, often involve taking a lot of tests for defects that you stood, that got fixed, and you have a test that verified they got fixed from earlier, and and just performing that test on an ongoing basis. And some tests that are just verifying, you know, these features are still working, right? These features haven't regressed, either because of reemergence of an old bug or because something's hosed it in the latest development. So regression tests are a particularly big group. And, and often those end up being huge number over the years. Very, very large number. Um, when we rolled out a product from here, some about five years ago, on, on an app-based product, which is used worldwide now, we um, uh, we had about 900 uh, tests when it was released. And over time, these end up accumulating more and more for regression tests because you know, you're just fixing things, and you want to be sure that it's still fixed, and you end up having a huge set. Um, often these can't be, can't be run in the build. You can't run all regression tests. Some of them require UI-based tests other things, et cetera. And so you end up a regression test suite that's only run occasionally, um, like once a week or you know, once a day, or something like that, a large regression test suite. And these are often you know, sanity checks that we haven't screwed something up particularly, right? Um, um, okay, uh, good. Um, yes, Will? Can an assert be counted as a regression test, or would it have to be part of an actual like, test suite to be like a true regression test? Um, like if you're making sure that something doesn't pop up as a negative when it should never be a negative, and it was before, and you just put an assert in to sort of reinforce that. Yeah, so, you, so if, I, if I understand what you're saying, you're saying, look, you have an assertion in there, and maybe at one point I was running, but this might catch cases where suddenly something's been broken in the code. And suddenly, this catches, uh, by virtue of it testing in the assertion, a regression there. And so, yeah, I'd say that you can view that as a as a regression, um, a regression test of sorts. I mean, it's a, it kind of comes for free, doesn't it, as a test because the assertion is automatically being executed. And one of the most important things about assertions, if you think about it, ladies and gentlemen, has to do with with uh, this this phase here of going from failures to faults. This is debugging. If you have assertions all throughout your code bases, often you end up finding uh, a failure that's closer to the fault. Because if there's an underlying fault, like you know, it's 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 set. Uh, this entry in this dictionary to null, or it's inserted a duplicate key, or you know it it uh, changed this from being a sorted array, or whatever. Um, 
if your code is littered with assertions, that may be found really soon. And so you may see a failure caused by the assertion that you know, catches it much quicker after the fault. So it's much more proximate. Whereas if, if you didn't have assertions, it'll be going for a while until the program blows up because it, it you know, it needs it for some user action and realizes, oh, I don't know what to do. There's, you know, there's bad things in place or it loops forever and it crashes. Whereas if there's an assertion, it may find it like really quickly after the fault. So it allows tracing down the faults more easily if you've got these assertions. Assertions are your friend, ladies and gentlemen. And maybe tomorrow you'll tell me why assertions Uh, okay. Um, mm, um, often there's a discipline in place with teams that a defect is not fully resolved and closed by the developer It has to be inspected by the tester that reported it, or a tester, or the end user that reported it. Because wh why might you not have the, the developer close it? Yes, it makes sense. Uh, the same reasons you use button testing. Yeah, yeah, because the developer may not understand. These things occur surprisingly frequently, but the developer may not understand actually what exactly was meant by the defect report. Um, You'd be surprised how many developers read at times a defect report so quickly they miss some of the core elements. And so they think, they go, oh, yeah, 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 I know what that's about, and they fix it. But they didn't really fix the issue that was being reported. They fixed what they thought it was reporting. And you know, if if they if they have it under their power to say it's closed, it's gone, done, I dealt with that, they may be fooling themselves. So often you have a, an extra step there. Um, defect tracing system. I'm, I'm not going to do you on that. You've, you've reported enough defects, I think. Um, you should know various things to report. What's the difference between a severity and a, and a priority of a defect? Severity has to do with how bad the consequences are if it materializes, if it comes about. It crashes the system. It corrupts the disk. It you know, corrupts the database. Um, it it uh, you know, hangs or, or runs forever, um, never terminates. Um, yeah, these are really high severe things. And yeah, very high severity things. But there might be, lo give me a low severity thing. Yeah, Matt. No, I was just going to ask, is it always the case where severity and priority is a positive linear correlation? No, there, so generally if you consider a certain, well, uh, I'll, I'll come back to it. Great question, I'll come back to it. Um, just a second. What does priority consider that severity doesn't? Yes, well. Yeah, the probability that occurs, sort of likely of that it's actually going to come about. So, so Matt, to answer your question, if you consider a certain prob level of probability, if that's a given, and you make it worse severity, yeah, it's going to be higher priority. But there may be many things that are high severity, but are very low priority, just because they're extremely unlikely to occur. You almost never see someone with, you know, um, that antiquated a system but the newest version of the browser or um, you know with this weird combination of simultaneous plugins that that do overlapping things but they have both installed or you know you you uh, you know this this only uh, this only occurs after um, you know millions of hours of use and and by that version, uh, but by that time, you know, a, a newer version will, will be out that will eliminate this issue or what have you. There's certain things that are just so low likelihood um, 
you know, you're out of memory and out of disk space at the same time. You know, um, it may be viewed as so implausibly uh, unlikely that it's actually a low priority, but it's it, even though it's a high severity. So it definitely can happen. Um, you know, uh, you know your customer base really well, and this is really only an issue for one customer, and for them, they have a special version of software anyway, or, or something like that. And you only sell to big ticket, uh, you know, institutions. Um, give me something that's, by contrast, high priority, even though it's low severity. Yeah, well. Maybe like some weird just graphical bug that's just really inconvenient and happens all the time. Yeah, yeah, totally, um, entirely. Uh, or you, you know, the splash play page has something embarrassing on it or inappropriate or, or you know, well, it might, might misspell the company name, but, you know, or, or have, a, uh, have a spelling issue uh, uh, that, that makes it look weird or the colors are just horrendous, or you know, it, it makes, makes weird, weird sounds um, you know, at certain, certain times, or it translates, um, translates certain common words in a most inappropriate fashion when it's doing text to speech or the speech to text. Um, and that could lead to, you know, to, to uh, startled or offended responses. Um, uh, there were certain things, by the way, which your system <laughs> did, not, did not accept well as text. It, it kept on having certain misunderstandings of what it meant. And you got to blame Bill and the boys at Microsoft for that one. I don't know, I don't know what to tell you. It's, <laughs> yeah, so it's a Windows problem. Yeah, yeah. Um, in any case, um, the point is, those can be things that are very obvious. You know, in certain cases, you can have things that are obvious, embarrassing. In a, like, like you definitely don't want it. Even though severity-wise, it's not crashing. The system is not corrupting things. It's not delivering negative value. But it's, it's, it, you definitely don't want it. Um, uh, separation concerns from testing. Well, separating things in different pieces of the program generally enhances testing. Modularity enhances testing. Taking a big piece of code and dividing it into sub pieces makes clear what those sub pieces depend on because they have to take them as dependencies. They have preconditions, post conditions. They have to have arguments passed to them rather than just being stuck together uh, in the code. And each one has a job to do in life that presumably can be well defined. And you call it, and you can test just that job in life. Um, it, it, it aids testing. Um, uh, test test reviews are, are good. Um, yeah. Okay. So um, yeah. So what does peer review do besides finding bugs? Well, a heck of a lot. It spreads learning. It spreads knowledge. It spreads stylistic understanding, and it keeps developers honest. Right? If they have to go in front of a council of their peers to have their code looked at, it may just make them a little bit more conscious of how they write that code the variable names they use, the, uh, the commenting that they do, the, 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 the clarity of how they express certain things. Um, OK, we kind of talked about this. Um, there's often long times associated with testing. And this is one of the reasons why you need to be careful when deciding whether or not to fix a bug, because you might not have time for another, another round of testing. Thorough test, you might not have time to run those regression tests, right? You might have posed an earlier feature of great importance to the user by trying to fix this minor defect. And if you don't have time to know that, because you don't have time to run the regression test, it may be one bridge too far. Estimating undiagnosed defects, I talked about it, and Liskov substitution principle. I'm going to talk about that. Um, alpha and beta testing. Alpha and beta testing are often more, in beta testing particularly, it's often more of a way to raise awareness of your product and, and get people excited about it and sort of giving a sneak peek and maybe get a leg up on competition uh, than it is um, like a serious testing enterprise. Not to say you won't get any, but the quality of the defect reports will be smaller. 
people who turn a lot of defect save may just uninstall it and not come back, or they submit poor quality defect reports compared to trained testers. Um, what's a test escape? A test escape is a defect that is not detected by testing. And it makes it out. It makes, makes it out. <laughs> even if the customer. And um, test escapes are not known in the software world. Um, and they are uncomfortable <clears throat> for not just the testing team, but for the, um, for the project as a whole, because it may lead to lower perception of the value delivered by a product. Um, test escapes can be really useful, by contrast, for learning. Principle in life. Ladies and gentlemen, we all make mistakes. We all make really silly, dumb mistakes. We're often blind to our, we, we, we're blinding ourselves sometimes to just how, how how short-sighted our, our decision-making is, or how, um, how irrational sometimes we are at certain times in making our choices. But you can turn the negative consequences of a bad mistake into a net plus if you can learn from it. Learn how to head it off in the future. Learn how to detect it if it does occur. And test escapes can be like gems, like jewels because they can clue you into how to improve your test process. How can we do testing better? So they're embarrassing, like so many things in life when we make mistakes, but they're incredibly valuable, like so many mistakes, in terms of, of helping us do better if we're just willing to listen to them and, put them and, and, and build on them and, and, and um, you know, take them into account in our processes. Put in place new types of tests that would have caught those sort of defects um, so we can head them off or, or detect them sooner. Um, you may discover a whole class of defects you didn't even look for, and maybe it's a class of programming issues that you can go back and fix. Or maybe you just want to supplement your test, your test suite to better, um, to better you know, intercept these and find them earlier. Ladies and gentlemen, test escapes like um, other lessons about our mistakes in life are, are like jewels and, and are precious that we can listen to. Yeah. Um, black box and glass box testing. What's the difference? I think, it's, I think everyone knows this quite well. But black box testing, how does it differ from glass box? Or white box, I'm sure it's called. Yeah, well. Just black box is just, you basically know what you expect it yeah, yeah, you know what it's supposed to do when you test on the basis of that without knowing how it's implemented. That's internals. If it, if it got replaced by a new implementation, it got refactored. We talk about refactoring being updating code in a way that doesn't change the functionality, but it improves, for example, quality or performance or you know, clarity, or transparency, modularity all these non-functional attributes. Um, black box tests will still be just as valid with the new code. Glass box tests may have to be evolved, right? Because like, they, they work in a certain way with the algorithms or data structures or the, the uh, variables in there, and they may have to be modified. Um, talk a bunch of, um, a bunch of uh, types of of um, techniques for building up tests. I want to talk about those in a moment, but I want to talk about this issue, ladies and gentlemen, of automated versus manual tests. Give me some negatives about automated tests. One. Yeah. Yeah, Matt. Sorry? Yeah. How many implement them? 
and and time it takes to reimplement them. Why do I say that? The code changes often the tests break. Or if the interface changes, think about a test that's going through the user interface, right? Maybe you have to rewrite the test. So sometimes tests have to be rewritten as the program evolves. Glass box tests, especially, as, as Matt, to which Matt alluded, um, but as Kareem alluded, um, you know, as the system evolves, um, you have to um, sometimes redo the tests. Um, Will, are you going to say something? Well, yes, it's like kind of a positive and a negative because there's often like set and forget. So if you're not reviewing what your automated tests are sometimes, sometimes they won't be testing anything. Sometimes they're testing stuff that's been changed and you don't realize it. Totally. It, very good point. Uh, I mean, that's actually a key point. Like this test might have had a job in life a couple of versions ago, but now it really doesn't serve any real purpose, and um, it's taking time to run. Maybe it's run manually, maybe, uh, but but uh, if we think about automated, it's it's just maybe running in a test suite, and it's just a burden. You know. So yeah, well, on top of that too, I guess is like you, if you're the one that wrote the test suite, you might go, oh well, we're testing for that, and by thinking that, you might not go and review that test case, and it might still be passing for some reason. Yeah. But you might not you might sort of ignore having to test for the same thing and you might be Good point. Something. So you might, it might give you a sense of hubris, like, oh, well, we've got that covered, when yeah. really it's more shallow than you think. The, the, what is ostensibly a test has not really probed some of the key issues that, that need to be probed, and it's lulled you into a false sense of complacency. Yeah, so absolutely. Um, many a time have I seen this sometimes even on student projects. Um, so, so absolutely. Um, uh, manual tests, what are some shortcomings, in, uh, shortcomings of manual tests? Take any time, someone yeah. has to actually run through and Time and availability, responsiveness. So man, you know, this bug got fixed, okay, now you've got to rerun all these manual tests. It's a lot of work often. Maybe the person's not available at that time. Um, by contrast, automated tests you can run quickly often, or, or at least you know, a lot quicker, a lot less human time, if they're still working, following the evolution of the UI or what have you. Um, what's a good thing about manual tests? Yeah. Um, sometimes it makes Well, sometimes it's your only option for certain things that you'd like to automate, but you just can't. The other thing is, right, right. with manual tests, um, you run the risk of the tester not doing things quite right and finding bugs that uh, that they weren't necessarily looking for. You know, if someone That's clicks right. on the wrong menu uh, item and yeah. you might just dis or discover bugs without attending to it. Totally, yeah, so absolutely, and, and um, it bang on. So often you end up discovering things that were different from those for which you were looking. Those weren't the droids you were looking for, but you find them, right? Um, so um, you, you end up finding something where it's really slow, or it does something weird, or you're right. Um, another feature that was on the way there breaks, or you, know, you just stumble across another issue. Um, so, Manual testing actually allows you to probe a lot of different things and allows you to, to sense sort of non-functional quality, you know, quality issues, like things that are broken that, that, that are usability concerns more than bugs, more than functional defects. Um, so performance issues or security issues or issues with aesthetics or you know, painful usability things, or confusing things, or ugly colors. You can capture all of these, right? And and uh, and a use in a in a manual test, right? Yeah. Um. So manual tests are really valuable things, and as Mesa alludes to, you can do 
manual tests in a very exploratory way. Like, you can go a different direction and, and fruitfully find a bunch of different problems um, than you were originally planning to do. And that's very, very valuable. Um, test case design. Equivalent classes, I referred to these earlier, boundary values often between equivalence classes, like the last seed in first class or business class compared to the first seed in, um, in economy class. You want to make sure that it knows where that division is in terms of the rows of the plane. Um, or you look at you look at like cases where some planes have middle aisle window but then some of the rows change to have only two and you want to make sure that occurs at the right place. Um, Latin squares, I didn't talk about this that much. The idea behind a Latin square um, is similar to, to what we're dealing with with orthogonal rays at a certain level. It's a, it's a different approach. It's, it's different. The idea here is, look, um, equivalence class and boundary values, these have to do with particular input, like how do we choose it? But often we have more than one input at once. We might have a set of parameters. We might have a set of fields and form that we're submitting, right? Um, set of buttons or drop downs in a, in a web page or on an app, app UI. What combinations do we check? Sometimes we can't check all combinations. Maybe, maybe the combinations we have to check are different configurations of the system. Um, so try it with um, Iron Python and um, the Oculus Quest um, uh, together, and Iron Python uh, with the Oculus Rift. I don't know. Um, I'm, I'm imagining different configurations. Maybe we don't always have the chance to test all possibilities because it's 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 it, they involve manual setup and and um, tear down, and it's quite expensive. So we pick judiciously. Instead of picking all possible combinations, Latin squares basically is you want at least one case where you try Iron Python, another one where you try the Google library, another one where you try the Microsoft library or something like that. At least one test case for each. And then independently of that, you want at least one test case which, which um, does it on the Quest and another one which does it on the Rift and um, um, you know, some other system. Um, so there you're, you're guaranteed to have at least, each thing is tested at least once. But you don't worry about with which other one it's paired. Orthogonal array, what's the feature of orthogonal array, the key feature? Yes, Matt? Reduces number of tests by eliminating pairwise testing. Yeah, it, it basically focuses on pairwise testing. Um, and it, it is guaranteed to test every pair of combinations, even though it doesn't. I should be careful how I say that. You can't test all possible combinations. So you rule out all sorts of combinations. What you guarantee is that for every possible pair of values of each possible input, you have at least one test. But you don't test all possible combinations. Just you guarantee every pair of them. Because often problems that occur, if they're not a problem of one input alone, which can be found by Latin, like Latin squares or Latin hypercubes, they're found by incompatibilities, like pairs. Two things don't play together. So Firefox doesn't work nicely with the Zotero plugin or Firefox doesn't work well with the the um, uh, you know the the plugin from um, uh, from Refworks uh, or from Mandalay or what have you and so often it's 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 not just like one arbitrary combination of things it's like this doesn't play nicely with that it's a pairwise thing Kareem were you going to say something no. So let's let's consider. 
consider, I'll try to come up with an example just on the fly. Okay. Um, and if it's confusing, I'll, I'll call some slides up. Okay. Um, suppose on a form we have three drop downs, which I'll call A, B, and C. Maybe one's, you know, um, you know each category. Another is, you know, your uh, self reported gender. Another is your um, problems. Something like that, right? Um, I'm going to, for, for, for lack of, um, uh, for lack of imagination, I'm just going to uh, write uh, 0, 1, 2 um, as the possible values of this one. Maybe we have two of them for this. Maybe we have, um, you know, uh, uh, four of them for this. Something like that. Okay. Um, now, if we consider, so, it, I want to test this form to make sure it works properly. Okay, that's the idea. In order to test it, I want to test to make sure it works with all the possible inputs that I get. Okay. Um, now that's a laudable goal, but it may be that that formulating a test for every one will be expensive. Let's let's consider this case. Let's suppose we have these three, two, and four. How many total test cases are there? Well, it's three times two times four, which happens to be 24. Okay. Six times four. Yeah. Um, 24, and I can list them out, right? There's zero, zero, zero. So this is the value of ABC. We test the system with, with these. We test the system with zero, zero, one. Test this is one zero zero two, right? This one for this one, this one for that one, and that one. Um, this is two zero zero three zero zero four, right? And now, you know, I want zero one zero, right? Um, zero one one zero one two zero one three zero one four. You can almost make a song with it, right? Um, and and then and that's only the zeros, right? I got to do the same thing for all the for one here and for two here. There's 24 of them. A lot of different combinations. And in general, if this were combinations, call them cardinality A. There's that many of them. This is the size of this possible set of B and B and C. So if this were, let's say. 20, and this were 50, and this were 10, then you would have 20 times 50, or 1,000 times 10, 10,000 combinations. Mm -hmm. um, so sometimes we'd like to test it early, but, but we don't have the luxury of testing with all possibilities. So the question is, how are we going to test it judiciously? How are we going to test it in a way that's, um, that, that is considered, that's um, deliberative, that, that we'll find things that are more likely to be problems, OK? That we, we put our time, we get greater bang from our buck. We put our time into things that matter. We're more, we're more likely to test to find things for, for our chosen test cases that if we go test it randomly. That's the idea behind both ortho Latin square and orthogonal array. A Latin square would say, look, let's, let's not do all possible you know, um, uh, combinations of these, all possible 24. Let's instead pick some where at least in one test case we're guaranteed to have a 0 or a. At least in one test case, we're guaranteed to have one for a, for a, and another one we're guaranteed to have two for a. We, we try, we're guaranteed that we try each possible value of A in some test case. But that can be paired with any one for B. We, we want to make sure this one test case with B being 0, another one B being 1, and similarly with, with C. We could create a, a list of these. You know, so, 
So gosh, I mean, I'm, I'm not gonna take the best one, but zero, 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 it's like I, I check off each of these guys, right? Um, and I'm not gonna perform a Latin square because um, uh, I, I don't have the requisite computing power right now in my head, but, um, but the idea with the Latin square is you, you test each one of these at least once, but you never repeat. So you never go back and, and test that. But, um, so maybe I'll test one, one, one. Mm -hmm. That will test these guys. Mm -hmm. um, and um, now I, I've got to I've got to repeat this because, you know, this one I don't have much choice. And two I haven't done yet, so I'll say two. And then I'll say, um, maybe I'll do zero. I have to pick something for that. Um, and I'll say two, zero, two, right? Uh, yeah, I had done this before, but I don't have much choice. I need some value for that. And I've, I've now tested this guy and this guy. And then, look, i gotta got to have some repeat here. What the heck, I'll say zero, uh, one, I don't wanna repeat this guy yet again, and three. Okay, there are four test cases where I've, I've, I've had at least one that had zero, one that had, you know, each of these possible values is represented here, right? So I have at least one test case where I've tested each possible value of C. I have one test case where I've tested each possible value of B and each I have one test case where I've tested each possible value of A, but I haven't, I haven't done all possible test cases. I've just done that subset. Does that make sense? Now, what does an orthogonal array give you compared to that? Well, what it would give you is something stronger yet. And what would that stronger yet prescription be? But it would guarantee, this is kind of a weak thing, right? You've got to have at least one of these, each possible value of these, at least one there. What an orthogonal array would give you is, look, i got to have at least one test case where I have zero and zero, and zero for A and, and zero for B. I've got to have at least one where I have zero for A and one for B. Um, any possible pair of these. Um, um, or have A being one and, and B being zero, A being one and, and, and B being one. Um, but I also need to guarantee that any possible combination of A and C is represented. So I've got to have one with zero for A and zero for C, zero for A and one for C, zero for A and two for C, zero for A and three for C. I've, I've got to have it somewhere. And I've got to have each possible combination of B and C. But I don't need each possible combination of A, B, and C. Just, just a subset of those, like this. This was a subset that gave me one value for each of these. An orthogonal array gives you each, each pair of, of each set of columns is tested at least once. Does that make sense? Um, and I'm tempted, to, I'm tempted to do it. Um, but it will take time, and I'm keenly aware of opportunity cost. Um, and uh, could I do it? Yeah, I think I, I probably could. Um, uh, do you want me to try? Do you want me to try? Maybe not. Okay, okay, you get the idea. Yeah, so if you have one input, yeah. Sorry? You, you wouldn't use either of these techniques. The Latin's good question, very good question. You wouldn't use either technique. So both of these techniques, orthogonal arrays and Latin squares, they're all about you know, combinations of inputs, okay? So, and they're all about Kareem trying to avoid the combinatorial explosion of all possibilities, trying to do all possibilities of A, B, and C, because that becomes infeasible. Imagine one of these you know, was, was uh, something that had 100 possible values. It can become prohibitive to examine all possible combinations. So instead, you do, um, you, you, you sort of pick judiciously. Uh, look, and, and I'm gonna try to motivate this. Rather than, than, than doing that in front of you, 
I'm going to try to motivate it by, by this. Look, um, so much of testing in my mind is about passing a certain red face test, OK? Um, it's about passing a red face test in terms of um, being able to look someone in the eye and say, yeah, we did basically a serious attempt at testing. And look, if you haven't tested at least once for A, each value of A, can you really say to someone, I tested this thoroughly? It's kind of hard to argue, right? Um, you could say, uh, yeah, I tested it with, I tested it really well, and they said, did, did you test it with each age group? Um, no. Um, you say, well, did you notice that, you know, the youngest age group, your system was hosed, you know, it, it, it crashes? Yeah, I guess I should have tested it with that. So, so it's hard to argue you tested a system thoroughly if you haven't tried each test value at least once. You didn't try it with men or, or self-reported women. You know, you're not, you're, how can you be saying to test it or for different provinces? How can it be said that you tested it well? You, if you haven't even tested it once with Saskatchewan to make sure it works. So if you want to stand up and, and in a non-embarrassing, don't want to embarrass yourself, it behooves you to test it at least once with each, with each possible value of these. And that's what our, our, our Latin squares does. But Latin squares does this in a clever way. It does it in a way that you don't do unnecessary work. It kind of gives you a minimal set that, that will be guaranteed to have each possible value of A, each possible value of B, each possible value of C without doing extra work. It's kind of, what's the minimum I can get away with and have that problem? Because without that property, how can you be said to have tested it thoroughly? But then orthogonal arrays comes into the picture. And orthogonal arrays says, look, the problems do are sometimes of a character that they show up, you know, for just value one with A. But and, and that's a that's a type of um, that's a type of bug up there, that it just doesn't work with Saskatchewan, but it works with every other problem. But sometimes Sometimes it's a pairwise thing. Sometimes it's a thing that it's not one value of A. It's that you know the youngest, the oldest age group in men doesn't work well, or something like that. Or the oldest age group in women doesn't work well with the system. It's a it's a pair. That isn't as compelling an example. But thinking about like like um, uh, plugins and browsers is you know. It's a, it's a compatibility issue. It's, does this play well with that? Um, and, and so if you're going to test, you're not going to test all combinations. That would be prohibited. But if you're going to test judiciously, you're going to test in a deliberative fashion. You're going to test in a careful fashion. You want the greatest bang for your buck. Maybe you want to be extra confident beyond just having each possible value of A. Maybe you want to test at each pair possibilities, you know, um, works, right? So you've tried the oldest age group in every province at least once. You've tried, you know, each age group in each province at least once, right? That would lend a, an extra degree of confidence is working. And it turns out, it turns out, it's not obvious, but the mathematics of it are such that with orthogonal arrays, you might think it's going to take you most of these 24 possibilities to get your orthogonal right. No, you might take eight of them or something, or five of them, or something. It won't take more than that, but you know, eight or 10. So the point is, you can enormously cut down your work by orders of magnitude, by choosing wisely, by choosing judiciously, by choosing the things that matter or are likely to show a defect. You don't have to do all possible combinations and, and you know, just, just do brute force thing. You pick the things that matter. You haven't examined all pairs yet, pick the pairs. Pick the pairs and do it in a way that doesn't should require you to review more. Does that make sense? Then you have to. Um, so that's what that's all about. And it doesn't, it doesn't apply for things in isolation. If there's only one field, 
you're guided by principles of boundary values and equivalence classes, but you don't have to worry about um, orthogonal arrays or, or Latin, Latin squares because there's no combinatorial explosion. There's no explosion of different possibilities for these different fields. It's really when you have a bunch of fields or the fields have a lot of possibilities and you can't test all possible, possible combinations. That's when you roll out Latin squares or orthogonal arrays. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, okay. Um, right. Um, oh man. I tried to emphasize this many times in class, but um, I will exhort you once more to remember the principle that God is coverage based testing. Is held across a bunch of types of coverage testing and cover. No level. Transition level. Prime path. It would have held if we had gone on to, to logic coverage. What are the three steps? Number one, suppose we want to test prime paths. What do we got to do? First, we identify the set of things we need to cover. What are the prime paths? We have an algorithm to, to enumerate. Secondly, we develop a set of paths from start to finish that include all the things we need to cover. In this case, we sort of figure out paths through the system that will hit all prime paths collectively. It can hit certain prime paths more than once, that's fine. But we, we figure out how to go from the start to the finish in a way it will cover all prime paths. Mm -hmm. And then, and then ladies and gentlemen, we figure out a set of concrete test cases. This means specific inputs and, ladies and gentlemen, and specific outputs that will realize those paths for the system. That Same thing holds for transition coverage. What do we do? Well, we'll figure out where all the transitions are. And we go. If statements go this way, go that way. Right? Um, loops. If you go into the loop, or you could not. Right? Um, there's a transition at the end of the loop back to its beginning. Mm. So we identify them. We figure out a set of paths that will go through them collectively. More than one path. Path from start to finish. Somehow it's got to go through here. It's got to go into the loop. Finish the loop. Go into this if statement. And continue on and return. Fine, that's one path, and it to check off those each of the transitions. I have another path that's not going to go into the loop, maybe, and it'll go in the alternative to that same if, rather than the constant, rather than the being true and false. And I'll tick off those ones. So we develop these paths. We say we want to go this way, or we want to go that way, or we want to go around that loop once, and come down the other Um And then we develop a set of test cases. Inputs and outputs. Each of these test cases has a specific input, like a string, and a specific output. Well, you know, maybe there's more than one input, right? It, maybe it takes three arguments, and you give a particular value for each argument, right? And then the output is, what does this function return, maybe? And you say, what, is, what do you expect it to return? Right? Um, it's a set of test cases that lead to these paths being covered, that make it go the way that will cover these things. Cover the prime paths, or cover the transitions, or cover the states. And that's how you do test coverage. Okay? That's the coverage procedure. These are the three stages of achieving coverage for any of the type that I talked about in class. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? 
Mm. By the way, I'll be sharing these slides with you, not merely the video. Um, okay. Estimation. Target versus an estimate. What's the difference between a target and an estimate? Mm. Ah. Target, uh, Target is often a specific point, and it's an aspirational thing. It's like we, we'd like to try to get it done by that. An estimate can also be a specific point, but it's more like a range between two different points. Well, we talked about range estimates, and we talked about point estimates. So you write them both types. But the key thing about an estimate is that it's a considered, it's, it's like a thought through understanding of how long it's likely to take. And it's better if it's in a range, but sometimes it's given in a point. But the point is, it's a lot different from the target. Target is, yeah, we'd like to, yeah, we'll try to finish it by Christmas. But that's not a, an estimate there. It's like, yeah, we can shoot for that, but it's not based on a really considered analysis of how long this is going to take. An estimate will consider, okay, what needs to be done, you know. How long do we think it's going to take? Who's away during that time? How many developers do we have? Um, you know, what what sorts of spike prototyping do we need, and what have you? Okay. Um, and a, and an estimate shouldn't be a promise either. It shouldn't be like take them as a guarantee or or what have you. Um, now we talked about two forms of estimates: uh, a point estimate and a range estimate. You alluded to. For your credit. What's a common problem with a point estimate? No. Yeah, and it, it doesn't communicate a sense of uncertainty. It doesn't communicate to the to the manager um, how confident you are about it, right? Like you give a, a number. That doesn't communicate, are you really confident about that? Or is it all over the map? Because you You've never worked with those three technologies before, and you're not sure how well they'll play together, and you don't know the degree to which they'll meet your needs. These things happen. Um, so that's one common problem. It doesn't communicate uncertainty. What's another common problem that point estimates have? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. They underestimate. They, they, they think they'll finish it sooner than it is, than it actually takes. Huge problem. What's an advantage? Yes. Yes. Well, Sam. Is it, uh, a promise usually is interpreted as a promise. Yeah. So gonna, often it's interpreted as a promise. Oh, okay. You'll get it done by them. Okay. Uh, great. Um, we'll put that in our schedule for the cut over to the new system. You know. You'll, you'll do it by December 15th, right? Um, December 20th, 2 p.m. Um, um, what's a problem with, or what's an advantage of a range estimate? Well, it communicates uncertainty. What's a common problem with the range estimate? Sorry? Yeah, it's often it's often unrealistically optimistic in terms of underestimating how long it will take. It's often also too narrow, much too narrow. So in other words, it doesn't. It's it's flattering in both accounts. Often we flatter ourselves. We say, "Oh, it'll take less than you know, we can do this within this amount of time." But moreover, we flatter ourselves how confident we are on on. Yeah, that's only going to be four to six weeks, four to five weeks, and it turns out it would have been much better if you had said, you know, uh, six to to twenty-four weeks or something like that. And and you're the one holding the bag, um, so you're you're underestimating. But it does communicate something. It communicates your level of uncertainty. Um, just sometimes you have to flesh that out more. Will, did you have something to that say? Was yeah. Uh, Okay, um, 
So often there's this optimistic bias and things. There's need to communicate uncertainty um, to managers. And there are ways that we can be less vulnerable to this. One of the key things you do, ladies and gentlemen, mark my words, my throat is raw, but I feel I need to communicate these things to you. Okay? Um, one of the most important things you can do, it sounds like a gimmick, but it's not. It's actually oddly important. People tend to be poor at estimating large quantities of work, like as a whole, and just kind of thinking. We tend to give what is sometimes called a wild ass guess. Like, you say, like, how long is that going to take? And we give an estimate, but it's, I'm not sure if I should share this with you, but there's a vernacular in Australia for this. Uh, in Australia, it's, it's called the bump block. Um, and, like, you have, no, you, have, you have no basis for it. You can just pull it out of thin air or something worse. Um, and you, 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 you say, that's my estimate. And if, if you do that as a whole, it tends to really, it tends to really understate your ability to think through. You're, you're just pulling something out of thin air. It's not, it's not, it's not a considered estimate. What helps a lot is you start to think, okay, what's actually required for this job? What are the particular tasks that are needed? What would I need to implement? Okay, I need a parser. I need to get a parser in place. I need to re research parser libraries. Um, we're going to need to upgrade or you know update this portion of the product because it's it's using an old version of the library. We really need to use the new library with this. Um, we have to modify um, uh, this interface between this part of the system and this other one. Um, and uh, you know we're, we're going to need to get this developer on it who uh, specializes in parsers but uh, is busy until a certain date. It forces you to think in very concrete, specific terms about what's needed, what, what the vacation days are, how long certain things will take, who's needed for it, etc. It's It's a very, very um, detailed accounting for what's required. And there, you, for each of those items, you estimate how long it's going to take. And then you combine those. And it turns out that's just a much better considered estimate than just like you say, OK, how long that whole thing is going to take. You really want to break it down. Ladies and, gentlemen. Uh, and that's behind, that's the idea behind what's called estimation by decomposition. OK. Um, Okay, um, now I need to talk with you until hoarseness overcome me um, about something that we covered on what well, may have been the very last day of class, or one of the last days of class, actually. It's the last day of class, just testing things together. Um, I need to remind you about list of substitutions. I said earlier in this session, just as the sun was just going down, actually it was a bit after something, but the sun, sunset was still visible out the window. Um, the Liskov substitution principle, named after Barbara Liskov and Jeanette Wing, formalizes, it gives a rigorous criteria for asking, is one type a legitimate behavioral subtype of another. Now, type here could mean, think of Java an interface, for example, or it could mean class, okay? Um, but it's asking, to what degree can we safely, from the sake of polymorphism, to what degree can we, if we ask if, is A a safe behavioral subtype of B, it's saying, can we substitute an A where a B is expected? So we're dealing here with systems um, that may have been written 
with respect to a B. In other words, maybe B is a, um, is a collection. Or um, maybe B is a hash table. And the code was written to use hash table. It takes the hash table past it. And we create a subtype. Let's say, you want to think about a subclass of hash table. It's our own special hash. Okay? Um, and we pass it in as if it were just a plain old hash table. We pass it in as hash table. Through polymorphism, right? That's what Java allows us to do, right? If we have a subclass, if A is the subclass of B, we can pass in A as if it were B, right? You've seen it many times. Um, so let's go to substitution rings last. Under what conditions is it safe to pass around A as B? What does A have to guarantee to be passed around safely as a B? In other words, what does A have to guarantee to avoid breaking the code that depends on a B? Yes, ma'am. It needs to follow the contract. Yes, it needs to follow a contract. But the contract here has some subtleties, and so I'm going to go through it. But you're exactly right, 100% right. It needs to adhere to a contract. But the contract, ladies and gentlemen, is not the contract required to just use a B. It's not the contract that a user requires. It's actually, um, excuse me, um, it, 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 it is, but it, it, it doesn't say you just have to only provide for A the exact same contract. It's actually, um, it can adjust that contract in certain directions only. It can actually make it a tighter contract. It can provide more guarantees. Um, it can allow a greater number, allow for a greater number of preconditions to be handled, but it can it, it 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 can only do that in ways, in some sense, compatible with the contract of B, so the the user is not really surprised by the behavior of of the subtype of an A. In the example, you may recall, the example here I gave was FedEx, right? The idea is. If you, all you know is there's a FedEx franchise in town, you go to the FedEx website and you see, you know, you have to deliver packages by noon to get to Ottawa by 5 p.m. the next day. Um, and you go to this FedEx franchise, there's certain things that FedEx franchise could offer that will be fine uh, with you. They could adhere to that exact same contract, delivered to us by, by 12, we'll get it to Ottawa by five. But they mean, they actually might do something which would be also perfectly satisfactory, but not the exact same contract. Give me an example. What could that FedEx franchise do here in Saskatoon that would be different from the FedEx one, but still perfectly acceptable? It's there by four. Yeah, guarantee it's there by four. Um, will make the drop off later. Yeah, I'll allow you to make the drop off later. You can make it by two p.m. in this in this franchise. You you might not be expecting that, but perfectly happy with it. It gives more leeway. It has, it has looser preconditions. It handles everything the FedEx does according to the FedEx website, but it but it it, it allows you more leeway, or it provides tighter guarantees. This is this whole contravariant covariant distinction that might have been spoken about in 440. Um, but but it, it can provide tighter guarantees for the post conditions. It'll say, we guarantee that it's in Ottawa by 4 p.m. or by noon the next day. And you'd be pretty happy, because it, it's still within the guidelines of FedEx. It has, it's there before 5. It's just it's tighter. It's, it's more guaranteed. But, what it, but give me something it, it couldn't do, that you'd be rudely Surprise, and you'd say, This is not FedEx, this is Fraud X. Give me, give me, give me something that it couldn't do legitimately. Expect you to deliver earlier. Than yeah, like if you walked in there and they said, Oh, sorry, um, you were supposed to deliver it by 11. You said, What the heck? I mean, I checked online and it said by 12. And they said, 
We're not FedEx, we're FredEx. Well, we're, we're not just an average FedEx, we're fraud, we're, we're <laughs> so maybe it doesn't say that. Um, we're FredEx, um, and you have to do it by 11. You could be upset, right? Because it breaks your plans. And so it is with, with, with the subtype. If the subtype, if you can call the supertype B with an argument, like you can call it with a negative integer and it handles it just fine. The subtype has to handle that. It has to be okay with that same thing. Um, similarly, what's another thing they could do that would be disappointing? Yeah. Drop it off in the year 3000. Yeah, like <laughs> drop it off in Ottawa in the year 3000. That's right. Um, the, they'll, they'll put it up in the second parliament tower. Um, and, uh, uh, so, um, so that would disappoint you. That would really surprise you because you're counting on the precondition of that X, and and that precondition is not met. It's violated. Um, so so it is here. Like if if uh, it guarantees if the superclass um, guarantees the method will return uh, a non-negative integer. And uh, this one, in fact, returns a negative integer, you can be really surprised because maybe you have it in a loop and you're counting up to what it returns and it will never, never end. Um, it'll be a never ending loop if you pass in that, that subtype. So the idea here is all about polymorphism. It's all about something, one thing masquerading as another. Here it's the subtype masquerading as if it were an instance of a supertype for code that just knows about the supertype, but it's like a FedEx masquerading as FedEx. What does it need to do to be a legitimate FedEx franchise? Um, so this is all in the context of polymorphism where we, we can pass things around, we talk about them having an apparent type, and then they have an, an actual type. So maybe you pass, you know, you, you have a parameter that's a reference to a hash table. What you pass in there, it could be a hash table, class hash table, but it could be a subtype of hash table, right? Uh, and, and there's this decoupling of what it actually is from the apparent. And you program against the apparent one, so the code may have been written against the hash table, but it needs to work with, with a subtype. It needs to work with your subtype. Um, okay. Um, so, so we're focused here on this uh, behavioral uh, issue. And so th this is formalized in the Liskov substitution principle. And basically, it's a question of how do we build object-oriented code in a way that won't break the code when we have polymorphism. And this gives us testing guidelines for this code. This allows us to figure out when we have object-oriented code, what extra tests do we need to run? And then one of the key answers is we need to test the Liskov substitution principle. If we create subtypes of a given type, we need to test that they maintain the properties of the supertype. Let me say that again. It is a point of significance and import. At the end of the day, Liskov substitution principle this class, one of the reasons I went through it is because it informs our testing. When we test with object-oriented systems, we often seek to test additional properties that are unique to object-oriented object -oriented programming, including that we're using polymorphism safely. And one of the key things we do, our code base introduces a subtype of a given topic. Maybe it's a subtype of a built-in Maybe it's a subtype of another of our classes that we provide. We need to test to make sure, to ensure, to guarantee that that subtype adheres to the Liskov substitution principle with respect to the supertype. That it observes all the properties, it respects, it adheres to, it guarantees all the properties of the supertype. And let's go substitution principle states according, let q of x be a, a property provable about the supertype. Okay, um, then that same property 
that same thing should be true. If, if we're counting on a, on a feature, a property, a guarantee for a supertype, then we need to be able to, all subtypes need to guarantee that same property. Okay? Um, and it may sound being picky, but it's just common sense. It's just like that FedEx thing. You don't want to you don't want to leave people in the lurch with FedEx and FredEx. You, you want FredEx to be friendly to, to FedEx's rules to avoid re, uh, rudely surprising people. And really what this is about is avoiding needless bugs. Because if you have a subtype that is just a convenient subtype you created so you can pass around what the heck into things, and it doesn't observe this, what's going to happen is the code that uses it as if it were a super type can have bugs in it because it's counting on the things being true that are true for its super type. For all that code knows, it's one of the super type. But you've actually passed in something that doesn't adhere to it, it can blow that code up. It, it, it's, the assumptions are violated and assertions may fail. The code may not terminate, et cetera. Okay? Um, so the basic deal is look. If there's code that counts, uh, that is just treats this as a super type, and you're passing it into that, it's got to adhere to the assumptions about the super type. If the subtype breaks these assumptions, errors and rework will, will occur. And there's three components to this. One is the signatures have to be compatible. The methods of the subtype have to behave consistent with those of the super type, and then properties have to be maintained. And really, to reason about this, you need specifications. You need contracts, ladies and gentlemen. So let's, let's talk about that. I want, I'm going to give you a few examples here that will put you in good stead. OK. Um, OK. Um, so here, we're dealing with specifications. And, and the people that, deal, that rely upon specifications are users of, of a class and creators of, it, of, the sub, of the subtypes, okay? And they have to adhere to these properties of the supertype, okay? Um, uh, oh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, okay. I didn't, I didn't actually have the examples in there. I thought I did. Let me, let me see if I do. Ah, okay, 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 okay. Here we go. Uh, we're cooking with gas, I think. Um, so here we go. Yeah, I'd like you to look at this. I want to walk you through this. I would have done this on the second to last day of class, but I, I didn't have time. And so you, um, the students who have come today, will enjoy the largesse of this session. Um, OK, here we go. Um, so we don't need to talk about this. What we need to do is to talk about these things. OK, here we go. Uh, uh, hide. Boom. There we go. So let's talk about this. Okay. Um, uh, okay. Um, okay. Oh, oh, no. This is not the right example. Okay. Sorry, folks. I will go get you the good example. Here we go. Um, there we go. And there we go. Aha. I had given you these as, as take home things, and I didn't come back to them, and I feel guilty. And so now you will enjoy the benefit. We went through a couple of these in class. Let's warm up with this. Here we go. So we're gonna look for three things um, here. We're going to ask, um, uh, is, are the methods compatible? Um, uh, do they behave consistently? Methods behave consistent with those of the super type? And do they preserve properties? Okay, um, and we're going to look at invariance and history properties. Okay, so here's a base type counter and get and increment. Okay, here we go. Um, let me see if I can make this full screen. Hey, no, come on, come on, boom, there, there we go. Okay, so this is a base type counter, get, and increment. It's a counter. We can increment it. Notice the specification is not very good for saying what it does if you increment it. It just says it increments it. It's not, not a great specification, that. 
And we get we get the current value where we increment it. This is just the uh, constructor. It initially starts at zero. Is this an okay subtype? Yes, Matt. No. And why not? Exactly. I mean, increment doubles, it says it doubles its current value. That's not the same as this, as incrementing by any stretch of the imagination. This cannot be said to this. Amongst other things, it'll always stay a zero. This one is. So this one doesn't, it's not a matter of the, the signature is being off. It's not like this has a bad signature. It's just that it has the same signature as this, void. It returns a void. It takes nothing as arguments. But it does something inappropriate. It does not behave consistently um, here. How about counter four? This one is the same as this one, but it, it provides a method called double value. Is that OK? Let's suppose that I have code. It thinks I have a counter. It, it takes it as an argument argument to this function that's a counter. All it knows is about this, but secretly I pass it as a counter for. It's a subtype of counter. It's a subclass, let's say, of counter. I pass it one of these. Can this, could this rudely surprise the owner? If they think it's a counter, but it's secretly one of these, could they be rudely surprised? No. No. They're going to be looking at this counter. They won't even know about this double value, right? And double value, someone else calls it from somewhere else in the code, um, but knows that secretly counter for it won't screw anything up. It could, whatever value it gets, it could have been gotten by calling increment a bunch of times. So it's, it's not like it gets into some whacked out state you couldn't get into a counter. Um, it behaves otherwise, just like a counter. Sure, it has this extra functionality, but that doesn't violate any feature of counter. It doesn't make you go into some weird, weird situation. So this one's okay. That's an okay subtype. How about this one? Counter three. Um, all, all this one does is it's the same as counter, but it has an extra constructor. It adds some niftiness to it, right? It, 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 it adds some freedom. And instead of always starting at zero, it lets you start at any integer. Construct a counter three, and, and you can start it at two or one or, or, or any integer. And Let's suppose that you had one of these and someone passed it as a counter. Would that be okay? Why not? What what could rudely happen? Speak on well. There's two things. One, you can set it to a negative value, which would be kind of a history. Yeah, thing. yeah, yeah. And, and like someone would say, let's suppose it were a negative value. Could someone whose code, all it knows about when it was written is that there are counters in the world. Could they be rudely surprised? Yeah, because because they could stare at this interface, the counter interface, and they'd say, well, what do you mean it has a negative value? You can't get to it through a counter. Counters can't have negative values. There's no, no way that you'd get to a negative value. How in the world, this is not a real counter. A counter, I can prove with this interface, you can't get to a negative. There must be something wrong. There must be a bug, you know, something's off. But it was a fraudulent subset. So that's one reason. I want to hear Will's second reason, and I'll be with you in just a second. And the other one is just like if somebody was calling a regular counter, they wouldn't know to put an argument in. Uh, that's true, but uh, it's it's not so much a matter of that. That's actually not a problem because, like with these others, imagine this is created somewhere else where they know it's a counter three, but they pass it in as if to to the code that uses it as if it were a counter. Sorry, I guess it wouldn't instantiate properly. If somebody thought they were using a counter, they wouldn't, it, it wouldn't be, it would be giving them an argument? No, but, but like if you had a function and it took an argument, one of its arguments gotcha. passed yeah. to it as a counter, right. Right. Okay. then someone could pass a counter three secretly. Right. Yeah, Matt? I think uh, setting it to have a negative value is an issue, but isn't the issue setting it to any value that isn't zero? No, because... Yeah, but you can increment it. And so it, it could then become one, two, three. So as long as you passed it something, if like if n were guaranteed to be positive, if this said like n is 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 non-zero, um I'm uh, sorry, is, is greater than or equal to zero, that actually would be okay. Um because 
anything you could get to with the counter pass, the counter three pass in, you could get to through this. This can actually increment it to any value greater than zero. What this can't do, I'm waving my hands about round off and sort of you know round over effects, but you can't get to a negative here. You can just get value positive to zero. So if this guarantee, counter three guarantee, n was non-negative, if, if that was a precondition for this, you could actually pass the counter three and it'll be fine. It's just that the fact this can be negative, that's something you can never get through this. Whereas a positive, you could. Does that make sense, what I'm saying? Um, okay, let's talk counter five. Okay, counter five, it's just like a counter, but, um, oh, it stopped, okay. Mm. Um, hopefully this is still recording. Um, uh, counter five, can we, if we pass this in as a counter, it, it starts at zero, always, I can assume, and it starts at zero. Um, and by the way, if you see this in an exam and you don't know, if this is mean it starts at zero, you could ask me, so yeah, it starts at zero. What do you think? This, this can decrement it as long as it's positive. Um, and so it requires to be positive. If it's positive, it can go down. So, um, uh, Matt? The effects for different cells on no phase cells, right? Yeah, it's not a legitimate subtype. And what could, be, what could happen with this one that could not happen with the above, with a counter? Its value could decline. Uh, Will, were you going to say something? Yeah, so its value can decline with this one. And so this one, if all you know about is the world, and the world is that counters start at zero, and they can stay the same value, or they can rise. You, you, you may have code, for example, that counts on this. Maybe you use the counter to fill in successive values of an array, like successive indices in an array. You're using it to count up. And you're counting the fact it never declines. And somewhere else in the code base, maybe someone will call decor positive when it does. It's a kind of five. Call it decor positive. And this thing you have a reference to suddenly goes down in value. And your code suddenly is seeing this, this apparent counter, the thing you think is just a plain old counter. It's gone down in value. And that could break your code, amongst other things. It, it could violate. You know, you're overwriting elements of your array or something. These are some, some examples. So this is a bad subtype. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to convey some tips. Look, the tip here is ask, is there any way a user, the apparent type, there was a counter, could be rudely surprised by the behavior of the subclass, like a counter three or a counter five or, or whatever the, the names of these, uh, these guys are, counter four or counter two. Um, and like surprise in the sense of the, this object of the subtype has behavior or properties that are impossible given the, 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 the apparent type. Look, programmers are smart folks, and they spend a lot of time with their code. If this is what they are working with, and they've been working with it month after month after month, chances are they'll have thought through, like, what can a counter do? Like, what possible things can a counter do in life? Well, I can have, have a zero, and it can go up from zero. That's what it can do. Um, it can be any value greater than zero. And so if suddenly you pass in a counter four or a counter three, rather, um, they, they'll say, that ain't a counter, that's a fraud counter. Or you pass in a counter five and it starts going down. They'd say, oh, come on. Given this interface, it can never decline. So, um, yeah, so... so uh, and you have to be careful about just like using subclassing for, for code reuse. You have to remember, you have to adhere to these properties. So we'll look at some more examples too. Um, now, by the way, with formal specifications, it can be very helpful to state what things you can conclude and what you can't. Like if you want to create a counter where you want to give the freedom to create subtypes that don't adhere to it always going up, you want to give freedom to the subtypes to allow this. You could put in something saying, you know, users of this class should not count on it not declining. 
um, just you know, subtypes may, may decline, or it could say, no, users of this class should not count it always being positive. In which case, bits are off. Someone who's using it sees that and says, okay, you know, I'm not gonna count on this, um, it's warning me. Um, so you can warn people that they cannot rely on it being true or that they can rely on it being true. Um, either way, it's, it's good um, to have them not have to come to, to sort of conclusions via reasoning. But just remember, if you don't provide a guarantee, they may come to those conclusions from reasoning about this. Just as here, they could come to the conclusion the value of this has to be zero or bigger. It can't be anything less than zero from the property seen here, and it can only rise. Um, how about this one? Here's another class. Counter. That's the same comma. That's our friend. At least mine. Um, um, so, how about this one? My counter two. It extends that, and the only thing is it has a, a reset. You can reset it to a value greater than or equal to zero. Is this a legitimate subtype? Well, is it the same thing as the decrement issue? Yeah. Yeah, this could lead it to go down. And someone could be holding this and say, oh, come on. Once it is value three, there's no way it's ever going to be less than three again. Um, maybe it'll stay at three all its life. Maybe it'll go up from there. But it, it, can't, it can't become two later, or one, or zero. But this one can. And so suddenly, you've changed the world's assumption out from the, how about this one? Dual counter. So, this is a kind of cool, this is, maybe I should have created a cool counter. Um, but uh, this is a dual counter. So this has two counters as part of it. Pretty cool, eh? Um, so it has a get and a get to. The get returns the value of the first counter. Get to return the value of the second counter. Um, increment, increments counter one, and increment two, increments counter two. Um, uh, is this thing a legitimate subtype of counter? After all, I mean, it provides an increment. It, 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 so, yeah? Turns out the answer is yes. It's a perfectly legitimate subtype. If, if you are passed in a dual counter as if it were a counter, all, all you'll know in your part of the code this thing you think is a counter, all you know is, you know, you initialize and initializes the counter to zero. It so happens it initializes another counter too, but that's fine. You don't know about that other counter. Then you call increment, it's, it's incrementing it in the same sort of way. So, yeah, curve, what's not to love, right? Um, it, it behaves like a, a normal counter. You call get, it returns the value, per. Is that a good counter? Yeah, it's a perfectly good counter. Um, no problem, sir. There's all this nifty functionality. Um, but it's perfectly, ladies and gentlemen, hunky dory. Um, actually, I'm not that. Um, okay, uh, how about this one? Swappable dual counter. Okay, okay. So, I, I, I see the voting with the, with the hand, and once again, that is, is exactly right. Um, swappable dual counter, what's the, what do you think? Does anyone want to vote this being a legitimate one? What do you think? No, it's not, why not? Yeah, if the second counter is lower than the first, it could lower the first counter, you swap them, right? Kind of makes you think, okay, under what conditions could this be violated? By the way, that's violating a history property, right? The history property, so I've been walking through, I haven't named it, but I've been walking through here things that are violations of history properties and things that are violations of invariant. This guy here um, is, now this guy is just, is, you know, it's not compatible, like behavior of the method. This one here, this counter four, um, uh, this one's perfectly fine, no violation. 
Cutter three is violating. Is this violating a history property or is this violating an invariant? History. It's actually invariant. Yeah, because the invariant is this thing is greater than or equal to zero at all times. At any one time, you could freeze the situation. The, a counter is going to be greater than or equal to that zero value. Uh, greater than or equal to zero in value. Is that okay? Um, whereas this guy can be initialized as something that violates that condition at any one time. This guy here, counter five, violates a history property or a or a, a, a invariant. I'll be with you just a sec. Is this violating history property or an invariant? History property. The history property, remember, it's, you compare it at two points in time. And, and basically, this has a history property, the counter, that its value never declines. It always stays the same when it goes up. And this violates that, this one here. You can only assess the history property, you know, you consider two points in time, right? Point now, point later. History property is later compared to now. And it can only um, say the same or go up, but it will. If, if increment basically has something internally that just went, I'm either going to go up by one or I'm not going to change. Yeah. Like it basically just sort of flips a coin and decides whether or not it's yeah. actually going to increment. Would yeah. that be valid or no? Yeah. It would. You're, you're saying for the subtype? Yeah. Oh, uh, no. Like no. Thing, right? no. No. Oh. Oh. <laughs> uh, Mm. No, because the subtype, like someone thinks it's a counter, okay, so and they call increment. They're assuming it's going to go up by calling increment. It's yeah. It's why it's not. Yeah, exactly. They said like, what the heck? Um, like I call increment, and it stays the same. Okay. What sort of counter is this? This ain't a counter. This is a fraud. Um, right? That's what it might say. They might even use that term. Um, Okay, so we're, we're, we're cooking with gas. Um, um, mumble. Mm. Um, oh, these are fun. Okay, course timer. This is not like, what time is it in the course? Um, it's too late, that's what it is. That's what it is, it's too late. Um, so, I don't, I don't mean too late to study. I mean, <laughs> not a bad at all hope. No, uh, it's, it's it's too too late in the evening. My throat feels a keenly. But course timer. Okay, this one begins a timer, and then you can call hours to find out how many elapsed hours or minutes to find out the number of elapsed minutes since it started. Here's bind timer. It extends course timer, and um, you can call seconds to get the number of elapsed seconds. That wasn't featured in, in the super type. But here it can offer you information on the on the on the seconds. Is that okay? Yeah, this one's fine. If you, if you think it's a course timer, you won't even know to call this guy, and it, it doesn't change anything badly. The sharp. How about it's like having that extra counter? How about modulo timer? So modular timer claims it's a course timer, but when you call minutes, it actually, it actually just like returns the number of minutes rounded down elapsed within the final hour since the constructor. It's like the number of, like it, it discards the hour component and just says like it's, oh, it's, you know, maybe it's 100 hours and 30 minutes, so it just says 30. Would that be a legitimate course timer? No, because someone could be, running it for 100, they're studying for the final for 100 hours and 30 minutes, and they call minutes, and it says 30, they've only been studying for 30 minutes. Um, and you have to put that in your activity log. And Osgood says, like, what's, what's up with that? Um, okay, I have a pausable timer. This one, you can pause it. Pauses it and resumes it. Suppose you you, you pass in one of these to this. Give you a hint. How if someone passes it in? Pause. <laughs> that would be pretty, pretty, pretty bad. <laughs> um, and then it's not counting up, and they say, "What the heck? 
like the clock's going on the wall and this ain't changing at all, right? Um, that, that would, is that a violation of the history property or invariant? It's actually a, a history property. Yeah. Um, how about resettable timer? You can reset it. To reset it to be from zero. No, because it's got, it can only go up, this one. Okay, I think you, you kind of get the drift. And if you, oh, oh, okay, um, yeah, anyway. <laughs> I'll share this. There's for a bunch of these with you, okay? Um, but you kind of get the drift here. Ask, can you be rudely surprised? Look for violations of how, uh, of, of how the methods work. Like, don't call, don't turn increment into a double, okay? Like doubling. That's, that's not a legitimate thing to do. To say, oh, well, we'll just double it instead of add one to it. Um, don't violate history property. Don't violate invariance. Um, you know, um, don't surprise the user with something that's impossible given the super type. That's the cardinal rule. You see that? And ladies and gentlemen, with that cardinal rule, I will request my lead. <laughs> Thank you very much. And I will see you tomorrow. Um, every year, ladies and gentlemen, every year, I give this review session. Every year at the end of it, I fear, you know, I'll have to turn in marks um, and the department head will say, so, so Osgood, what's with all these hundreds? Um, <laughs> and uh, no, you'll, you'll benefit from this, but keep your cool. Um, go through your questions with appropriate care. Don't rush it. You should have plenty of time. And um, get a good night of sleep because you're much further ahead now than when you entered the room. Okay? Thank you very much. So I read late, so about the first 10 minutes, like, did yeah. you talk about how the exam? Yeah, yeah, I did. Uh, so what let's, let, let's.